It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat's here. Richard Campbell's here. There's a lot of Windows news, including something they were sitting on all week long. Moment 5 is here. We'll talk about what Moment 5 means to Windows 11 users. There's a rumor there'll be new surfaces out. Paul will explain what to look for. And then we've got lots of AI news, including Elon going after OpenAI. <laughs> and... Scarlett Johansson on my phone. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therod and Richard Campbell. Episode 871. Recorded Wednesday, March 6th, 2024. Ash happens. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Collide. You've heard us talk about Collide before, but there's some big news. Have you heard that Collide was just acquired by 1Password? That is pretty good news because both companies lead the industry in creating solutions that put users first. For over a year, Collide Device Trust has helped companies with Okta ensure that only known and secure devices can get in, can access their data. Now, Collide's still going to do that. They're just part of 1Password now, which is great. Gives them more resources, lets them do more stuff. If you've got Okta and you've been meaning to check out Collide, don't hesitate. Now is a great time. Collide comes with a library of pre-built device posture checks, or you can write your own custom checks for just about anything you can think of to, to you know, really set the rules for who can get into your network. Actually, more importantly, what they can bring into your network. Plus, you can use Collide on devices without MDM, like your Linux fleet or your contractor devices or your BYOD phones and laptops. And that's really nice. Now that Collide is part of 1Password, it's only going to get better. Check it out at collide.com slash WW. Learn more. There's a great demo there. Watch the demo today. Explains it all. K-O-L-I-D-E. Collide.com. Slash WW. We thank them so much for their support of Windows Weekly. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show we cover the latest news from Microsoft. All right, you winners and dozers, gather together around at the feet of Paul Therat and, and Richard I, Campbell. We uh, will look up to you, our leaders, our fearless leaders. If you're lying at the feet, you're probably just next to me because I'm also laying at the feet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Paul is still in Mexico City. Uh, Richard's still in Puerto Vallarta. I'm on my way down to Cabo San Lucas. Unfortunately, yeah, leave to, uh, I leave Monday. So unfortunately, uh, Monday. Okay. We shall. Oh, I leave. Speak. I come. I leave here on Tuesday. I'm out yeah. on this yeah. Friday. So yeah. next week I'll be in Redmond when I do. You know what I realized? They actually, they, I think the State Department put out a warning uh, for people going to Cancun, which we're not, but yeah. uh, that mm -hmm. spring break is this month. And it was like, yeah. oh, I forgot about that. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, maybe I made a slight scheduling error. Well, it's my spring break, oh. too. And I plan yeah. to run around yeah. naked. Drinking tequila <laughs> like an idiot. You got this, Leo. I got I it. Read. Faith. Spring break with Leo. Oh, that's a winner. <laughs> so a little uh, inside baseball here. Before we began mm -hmm. the show last week, Paul right. had received. <laughs> I know. News. Leo, I give you some credit here because I, you were, I think, even looking at it. Oh, I looked at and it. I, and and I, I just said... removed it. <laughs> and I was like. I said, I don't, I don't see this. And we mentioned nothing about it, but it was literally like. 2 p.m. last Wednesday, right? That uh, moment five was announced. Well, they they delayed it twice, and uh, to be honest, they, uh, they I should say they delayed the announcement twice because, as far as the actual release goes, I guess it's I guess it is out sort of right. So, uh, the original plan was what I had suspected, even though you cannot be sure of these things these days. Meaning that last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, yeah, a week ago Tuesday was the week D that they typically do the preview update. That was the plan. Uh, they were going to announce it for that day at Mobile World Congress. 
And I don't know what delayed that, but uh, it went past that. And I, I think they've been, I think they started rolling it out on Thursday or maybe Friday, but it is rolling out a bunch of features, uh, none of them major, but a lot of them it's CFR stuff. So it's going to roll out semi randomly. And then the stable release will follow what we saw with uh, 23H2, meaning take a bunch of spaghetti and throw it at the wall and, you know, <laughs> see what lands first. It's kind of hard to say. Um, the patch Tuesday coming up next Tuesday, right? I think it's patch Tuesday. Yep. Will not be the stable release for everybody, but between that date and probably that next Tuesday in April, patch Tuesday, uh, that's that the rough uh, deployment time frame. You see how comfortable I'm becoming with being vague. See, Look at me. I can adapt. Sometime in the future, one could speculate. Yeah, yeah. It won't be yesterday. I can tell you that. Uh, yeah. It will be in the future. Yeah. One could imagine. <laughs> one will then be now, as we say in spaceballs. So, what but is it that we're? What are we getting here with this? Yeah. So, remember, Microsoft promised that they would only re release updates to Windows 11 once a year, and now they release them once a month. <laughs> and close. And right, yeah, it's a time frame. Um, the once a month updates are just cumulative updates. Sometimes they appear just as part of that month's security slash whatever update. Um, but then every quarter they release something that they don't ever name or call, talk about or whatever. But internally they call these things moments, and moments are collections of updates. So you usually you see several or a dozen or more updates all released at once, and that's what we just got. So. Moment four for Windows 11, which, you know, back in the day was Windows 11 22H2, came out as Windows 11 23H2, essentially, not exactly, but we'll just say yes. And now because Windows 11 22H2 and 23H2 are the same code base, Moment 5, which is the new one, are both, uh, or apply to both versions, the same version. It's not confusing. I don't even know why I've complained about this. Uh, you can get moment five on 22H2 if you still have that for some reason. Uh, really? Yep. <laughs> I know it's crazy. It's literally crazy. And like I said, I'm okay with it. I'm not just okay with it. I fully support it. You've learned to accept it. Yes. Yes. I've embraced, uh, what is it? Stockholm syndrome or whatever. That's uh, it. Yeah. No, you've been beaten right. sufficiently that you, yeah, thank you, sir. Can just, I have more? Yeah. Just, and over and accept. So there it, it is. It also, I mean, I'm just thinking about the coordination it takes to have a build of updates that isn't dependent on the version of Windows. Like that. Well, is, uh, that's astonishing. I, I, what could go wrong? I was, uh, nothing, Richard. These guys <laughs> are engineering defined. Yeah. I have no issues. Uh, like I said, I don't think uh, I'd really like to take 22 H2 with Moment 5 and on, installed on it, take it out for a spin and say, really, is this going to be the same? So what is it the H2 does exactly? I don't even know. Right. Well, listen, this is this all ties back to Microsoft in 2023 was working on Copilot across all of their products, right? Mm. And they wanted to get Copilot in Windows 11 into, you know, Windows 11. And they realized belatedly that if we don't ship this to the entire user base, all of our corporate customers are going to stay still and not upgrade. And they wanted to get it out to as many customers as possible. So what they did was released it at like at the last second, like the month before it was going to be 23H2, they released it as a preview update for 22H2. And by keeping those things the same code base, right, they can essentially ship the same sets of updates. They don't have to have two different KB numbers. I understand the enterprise customers all blocked it anyway until we can figure out <laughs> being enterprise. Like, I hope so. I they don't. You just, don't do this. Like, it's not even belligerent. It's just reckless, you know? No, or like, like I said earlier, responsible, and I love it. So don't worry about it. It's fine. Okay, it's everything's fine. Yeah. No, in, <laughs> on the IT side, we manage our updates. So you went and looked at update, realized Copilot was in it, went, nope, and it just stopped doing updates for a while. Yeah. I, I, I Listen, I, Windows is like a box of chocolates now. You never know what you're going to get. I like when I reboot and there's new stuff sitting there, you know, or something's different. I like that. I think it's cool. So... It just uh, keeps us on our toes. You know, it's nice. Now, there's an April Fool's Day joke waiting for me to pull on you one of these days where I actually can switch between two different boot drives and not tell you. And sometimes, <laughs> machine, it's Linux. Right, right. Yeah, just if put the right UI on. I'm That's not sure it. I would I even update to Windows 11 yeah. and Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How often does that thing update, by the way? I'm just asking for a friend. It's a, um, <laughs> as often as you care to build it yourself. 
Yeah. Right. Nice. Okay. I, that's, that's one approach. Um, <laughs> so I, looking at this, I, of course, like I did with 23 H2, I, I create this list of these features for myself, right? Because I've got to update the book and what does that look like? And the good news is it's not as major. I mean, it wouldn't be right at 23 H2 is a major annual feature update. This yeah. is a quarterly update, but, but it literally is a bunch of small features spread out across the platform. So it's not, I can't really point to one thing and say, this is the big deal. It's not, um, this will come up later in the show, but I, I will say uh, for the record that I've complained or not complained, I've observed a lot over the years that it was hard to keep track of Microsoft 365 for quite a while. And because they were adding new features across all the, the many, many products and services that constitute Microsoft 365 uh, for several years, right? It was very hard. And uh, then Teams happened. And uh, you could see the, the, the focus just kind of shift. Not that they weren't adding other features over here, but Teams became the focus uh, before the pandemic, but really with the pandemic, right? That was kind of a big push, right? And um, you very much that... Uh, pivot has occurred again and we're looking at copilot and so i don't think this is in the notes but one of the things that microsoft revealed last week was they have started a monthly uh i think it's on tech community like a monthly blog update about all the new features we've added to copilot in the past 30 days <laughs> and they're going to need it because it's going to be a bunch you know yeah. um and predictably there's a couple of those uh built into copilot and windows although uh uh, this is somewhere else in the notes. I apologize for jumping ahead, but I, I do think this is kind of relevant. Um, they're going to run into a problem here, which we still see with Microsoft 365, where imagine a, a I don't know, imagine, I can give you an exact feature. There's a word for the web, two, three, five, whatever years ago, got a feature that allowed you to take an audio recording and create a transcription from it, right? Right. Now, today with AI, this is very common, but at the time, deal. it was kind of a neat thing. It was not available in the flagship version of this product, as I think yeah. of it, Word for Windows, although it is today, by the way. So that took some number of years. It, it was not at the time available on the Mac. Obviously, I don't know whether it is now. And I don't think it will ever come to Word on mobile, but whatever. But, you know, they have all these different versions of Word and you have this matrix of features and some of them are here and some are here and some, you know, and that's kind of an example. And this is happening already with Copilot, right? Because Copilot is available on the web in multiple places, right? It's available in the edge sidebar. It's available in Microsoft or Copilot for Microsoft 365. It's available for Copilot in Windows 11 and 10. Um, and I'm probably forgetting a few places. I apologize. There's mobile apps and blah, 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 whatever. But as of this past week, and actually maybe before then, to be fair, there are, you know, you could construct a grid of Copilot features and kind of check them off where they're available and what implementation. And it's a little confusing, frankly. So that's only going to get worse because yep. this is, you know, an explosion. Appears in, uh, our copilot appears in PowerPoint. Now what? What is You're, that? Right. What is that? <laughs> exactly. Can I uh, generate an image in, uh, actually, of course you can. Why am I even asking that? I bet you can, yeah, of no. course. I mean, you know, now now, now it's literally describe a slide makes you a slide. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and hopefully if my experience with creating images is any indication, it will create a slide that vastly uh, exceeds what your expectations and uh, sets you off in a new direction. Right? And have Which weird kind of religious fun. iconography. It's it's a win-win. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And a three win -win. armed, four-fingered people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <That's real. laughs> Hold on. I'm sorry, Larry. I was leaving. So anyway, uh, uh, sorry, my buddy here is leaving work. Um, so What's going on in moment five? Um, AI features in across the board. There's some stuff there. Um, co they've given this a name now. So Copilot in Windows 11 could do two things before, broadly speaking. It could do the Copilot stuff as we knew it from copilot.microsoft.com or wherever. And it could do these things that we now call skills, which is a bit of a stretch, but you use Copilot to configure certain Windows settings, right? Um, they've more than doubled the number of Windows settings and features that they, you can enable or toggle or whatever through there. I, it, to me, it's a ponderous kind of way to do these things. But you may recall the original promise from back, I don't know, last September, maybe at that Microsoft event, was that these features will turn mainstream users into pros because they can just ask how to do something and it will either tell them or, or do it for them, right? 
uh, maybe a, a very basic preview of that uh, Satya Nadella predicted co-pilot as the new start button kind of idea. Maybe we go. not in actual real world use, but that's, you know, it, we'll, we'll take baby steps in that direction. So but it speaks to that idea of this will be the first thing you click. Yeah. And first thing, yeah, you might not even click it though, right? You might just no, talk to it. It's already but, there and it wants to talk to you about something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's important that Copilot has a cute little animation, which it does now. So that's fun too. Yeah. Maybe, uh, uh, you know, make sure, you know, it's, it, it's, it's listening. You know? um, there's some it's new AI out. features in Photos and ClipChamp. ClipChamp can do silence removal and preview. Um, photos, I, God, they really, get, they're just going to eke these things out. Generative erase. We might've talked about this because it was in the insider yep. program. Um, you know, slowly over time, um, I, oh, you know, we skipped the top, did we skip the top story? Did we just, did, I think we might've skipped the top story by mistake. No, we didn't. Did I not put this in here? Nope. Wait Sorry. a minute. It's the, se- it's the second story. The top story today nope. is the second it's story. It's the second story later today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ironically, as you'll so- soon learn, uh, better integration with Android, uh, and that's through the phone link app. And so if you own a Google Pixel today, I don't know, Richard, if you ever tried this, this is pretty cool. You can use your Pixel as a webcam if you connect it with USB cable to your computer. Uh, and it's it. really high quality. It's nice. Um, Microsoft is going to add that capability for any Android phone uh, on Windows, right, through the phone link app. Um, that works well. And you know, I eventually abandoned phone link just because it started changing the rights that it had on its own and asking oh, for re reauthentication. Okay. You need to reauthorize that. Well, I didn't deauthorize it. So you fixed yeah. it, started it. You yeah. Know, I had um, like, you know, you know what I've noticed I'm not minding you when you're not around. So bye. This is going to sound like a bizarre list of technologies, but in the mornings, Brad pings me on Skype with a link to Google meet, which I click and it opens in Chrome. <laughs> Except today it opened an edge and I thought that's weird. Is edge configured as my default browser? And it, and it was not, but the, as it came up in edge, there was a little box that said, Hey, we notice edge isn't your default browser. Let's pretend it is. It's, it's, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, let's pretend it is for a moment. And do you want to keep it this way? Cause like we just acted like we were the default browser. So if you thought Microsoft was done with that kind of behavior, um, think again, they're not, um, improvements, voice access. But now your default browser is, a harassment prompt. Yeah, exactly. Because what I wanted was not only not to use my browser, but to, yeah, to be harassed. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, I just made a little cute video about this and I updated the book chapter about this, but snap layout, which is that thing where you either drag the window or mouse over the maximize. Yeah, the thing I button. quickly turn off that one. Okay. Well, <laughs> there's another feature in there you're not saying, which is uh, snap suggestions. And it will basically put little app icons in some of the layouts. So you can say, well, I want that one. And instead of snap assisting one by one, it will just throw it all up there right. at one time. So it has a vision of how you should see your data. Yeah. It's never once done anything I wanted. So if that helps. But, then, but it has, has definitely detracted from what I was trying to do, which is why I turned it off. The reason I would turn it off is I drag windows around a lot lately. And if yeah. you drag anywhere if close, drag to it too close to that, it changes the shape of the window. Yep. And then it also gets in the way and it, mm-hmm. you get the UI comes down. It's like, guys, I'm, I'm trying to, position this. In fact, I, this happens every week with Windows Weekly because I position the Zoom meeting uh, window up there and it always, right now, it's doing it right now. <laughs> it like really wants to position it. You know? yeah, you'd be surprised how well that works when you turn that off. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, simple. Remember simple. Jerry Pornell? Jerry Pornell was uh, hmm. uh, not just a great science fiction author. writer, but he also wrote a column uh, for Byte Magazine for decades, right? And um, he, his famous phrase was, I make these mistakes so you don't have to, mm-hmm. which suggested a sort of plan that I don't have. I just make mistakes. But in my, in this case, uh, I leave that on because I have to experience it because I know people are going to ask about it and I have to write yeah. the book and I have to suffer like everyone else. So I don't get to make windows better for me. I just, uh, you know, grin and bear it or whatever. You have to complain. sort your computers into suffering and non-suffering. Right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, there's, they're changing the widget board again because, of course, they are. Um, there's going to be a navigation pane on the left now. I have not seen that yet. Let me just actually look at that right now. No, I still don't see it. Uh, again, these things are coming out kind of sporadically. Also, you can organize widgets, not the news feed stuff, but widgets into a kind of a 
uh, category view. So if you have like categories of widgets and you want to kind of group them. Imagine you were into this, widgets. You and yeah. your two friends yeah, yeah. that are into have widgets. Have you ever wanted to put widgets into a folder? No? Well, you can now. You know, that Especially kind of thing. Widgets. Yeah. Uh, so new Windows 365 features. Uh, I haven't, they updated Windows 365 pretty dramatically with 23H2. This is something I need to go look at again. I, it's been a while for me. And then the thing that Richard and I were sort of talking about before the show, Windows Auto Patch, uh, thank you, is uh, the Microsoft's, yeah, is an attempt to consolidate previous tools that different companies were using. Um, and uh, it will be as successful as all their other <laughs> enterprise initiatives, I would imagine, because people seem to get used to what they use and then get upset when that changes. So, yeah, we now, shall see. But the, you know, and again, I've had, you can go to Run As Radio and listen to the series of shows I've done with Ari Carla, where she explains why each one of these things exists, what it does better than the other ones, and why yep. there isn't one choice for everybody. There you go. See, it makes it seem like a plan. I like it. Yeah. They're just slogging through the mud of trying to do right by their customers. Right. And annoying them at every step of the way. <laughs> yeah. I, but, I, but an important yeah. distinction between auto patch and autopilot. Auto yes, patch is the IP equivalent of I give up. What happens happens, and uh, autopilot is pre-configuring machines at the yeah, back. Yeah, so it's like deployment versus updating. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. I would confuse those. Uh, they're only like two letters off. But yeah. naming is hard. <sighs> yeah. So that's moment five. Um, you know, I don't know. not a big deal. Long. Like there'll be another moment. Yeah, I mean, I I guess we just keep doing this. I you know, we'll see. <laughs> hey, I'm well, excited that this at least the the name nomenclature is carried through to a new year. That's something, <laughs> and to a new version of Windows, which is astonishing. Um, so there you go. Now, had Moment Five not happened, mm -hmm. uh, this news probably would have been the, well, definitely would have been the biggest news. Uh, kind of unexpected, kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, Microsoft yesterday revealed via. A Microsoft Learn support document, frankly, that uh, they were killing the Windows subsystem for Android. This not is the, the thing that not brings the Windows the, subsystem for Linux. Yeah, right. <laughs> Although there's some, you know, overlap there, obviously. But uh, I was kind of surprised by this. Is this a big? It feels like a big story. <sighs> so depending on your perspective, this is either the apocalypse or, eh, you know. So uh, do you think it must have been that nobody really was using it? See, this is the thing we don't know. So there's different directions to go on the cause of this, right? right. So just to be, so for people who don't know, Microsoft, you know, it's an optional feature in Windows. You enable it and it allows you to install the Android app store, uh, or the Amazon app store for Android, which obviously is the Amazon store. And then from there you can install Android apps. When Microsoft first announced this feature, June 2021 to or zero, whatever year, the, whatever year Windows 11 came out, uh, they described this as a store within a store experience. Because remember, at the time, they were talking up this notion that we're going to allow other stores in our store, something that Apple and Google were not allowing at the time. Right. And it never really happened to my knowledge. And this product certainly is not that. Like I said, if you, you could search the Microsoft for, store for Kindle. If mm -hmm. you click on the install button, it actually installs the Amazon App Store. And then you can go from there. The, the problem, it's not a problem, but it, it's, it is another store. It is another place, another point of updating. We already have all these different ways the system can be updated. Android apps today are updated through the Amazon App Store, right? They're not updated through the Microsoft Store. It's, it's not a store within a store experience. It's a completely separate experience. Um, the Amazon App Store, for those who don't know, is uh, incredibly lackluster. I, uh, Microsoft at one point claimed there were you thought 000. you saw a bad app store you ain't seen nothing yet yeah you thought yeah, <laughs> this would make you pine for the heady days of the windows 8 windows store um and you know all those fart apps that we used to joke about but yeah. this thing is horrible and there might be a dozen or less decent apps um you know kindles in there amazon what do you call it yeah. uh, audible's in there I think the Wall Street Journal app is in there one airline might be in there it's 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 lackluster Mm -hmm. Obviously, what everyone wants is the Google Play Store. Yes. Which well, if you, I, I don't know if anyone's following the story. These two companies hate each other. And yeah. every time I think there's going to be a little detente or something, it's not happening. Yeah. And it, there is a deep cultural 
uh, hatred of Microsoft at Google that was put you know in place not not you know formally but is because of the founders they hate Microsoft feared Microsoft back then thought Microsoft would try to kill them because that's that was their mo mm-hmm. and it persists to this day and it makes me sad because you know there's a lot of shared customers there and there's a lot of cross platform experiences that could be so much better if these guys would just work together you know yeah um, and it's it's too bad. Uh, Google has a very uh, unfamiliar product that is uh, so unfamiliar. I don't know the exact name, but I think it's called Play Games for Windows. Um, you can look this up, and it, it, it's a it's another Android emulation system. It's specifically for Google Play games. There's some selection of games. It seems to be more popular in Asia. The, the type of games you see there are uh, not the type of thing I would be interested in personally, but. Uh, they they were super clear when they announced this that we are not using Microsoft's technology. This is our own thing. It is on. It's uh, offline. It's it's on device. It's not streaming. Uh, it's not WSA. And you know, here we are. Whatever, a couple of years later, and uh, yeah. So, it, how many people use this? Probably not too many. Uh, we know the quality of the store and the apps is lackluster at best. Um, we know Google's not happening. And they've canceled it. And so now, you know, Leo asks, you know, what, um, what's the reason? And I'm wondering look, if I, it's just because nobody used it, right? I mean, that would be, that's one of the top contenders. Yeah, uh, the other one is that, be, well, no, it is, right? It didn't have what you wanted in it. And it yeah. was, a beast. and it was never going to get there. Now, yeah. it, we'll never know what the dynamics are here. Did Microsoft go to them and get promises that, oh, don't worry, we're going to have X number of top tier titles. It's going to be a real draw. Um, I don't know. I look, Speaking semi-theoretically, the notion of Android apps on Windows is kind of cool, right? Because it can fill some holes. A lot of the action with app development these days is happening on web or mobile, not on Windows. So sure, uh, just, just from like a dev perspective, how you can experience the app without having to go to a device. Yeah. So people, we have emulators for that. But yeah. I would argue but WSA thing, was better than the emulator. There are, yes, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly how these, well, you probably do. You talk to these folks, but yeah. I, I assume it's based on some sort of uh, Hyper-V slash whatever virtualization yeah, it's a, technology. It's, a virtualization. Yeah. it's really a race to see which one can consume more memory in the least amount. Of <laughs> okay. that's, that's hilarious. I was no, literally, as fun, you were saying that, I was just thinking in my brain, one of the nice things about Hyper-V when it hits the client uh, back in what, Windows 7? No, 8, Windows 8, was... You know, they did that work to make it work more efficiently on systems that would be connected to battery, not power, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, it's a, it's whatever. It is what it is. Know, but it's the, re- it's the reason that devs tend to use gaming worktops to do work because yeah. they need that much power. They just, you know, and, they, and I always have the animation of the jet engine firing it up as afterburn. It's like, oh, did you start Android Studio again? Like all fans right. pick up, the, everything runs hot. Like it, yeah, anyone who's run an Android emulator from Android Studio for whatever reason, typically mm-hmm. for a developer, right, will know that what you just said is, if anything, an understatement. Um, it, it is those those things are dog slow. It's, they're terrible, astonishing. Yeah, yeah. And the machines and, keep getting faster, and they somehow you know, this doesn't. And one would argue that WSA could have been made more efficient, but not without. You don't get those optimization devs until you show enough customer. Utilization. It's a, yeah, chicken and egg thing. And I, and I don't, like I said, I don't know. We don't know the dynamic. I don't know if Amazon went to Microsoft and said, you know, we're not seeing the usage to warrant the investment on our side. Yeah. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't know what direction it went. But we do know that Amazon has sent out letters to its customers that kind of point the finger at Microsoft, but, you know, not too directly because, again, partnering on this thing. Right. Um, it's too bad. Obviously, the Amazon App Store continues forward on Amazon's Kindle Fire tablets and on Fire TV and wherever else they use these apps. But it's not this is no one wants this, right? This is not what anyone, even Amazon's own customers would yeah. prefer, you know, Google Play, right? So anyway, right. we'll see. Google won't tolerate it. You have to go buy one of their Android devices. Yep. Well, or Microsoft could pay that license fee, right? I mean, they could make put yeah, that, not roll that into the cost. Yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Google, Microsoft could do it. I they just haven't. So I don't. It's not happening, right? I mean, they would have just done that and would have made Amazon one of the choices, and right. no one would have used it. But they literally just killed it. So my theory is that this actually has to do with AI, which I know is a bit of a stretch, and it's got a little bit of a conspiracy theory element to it. But I think Microsoft is a 
uh, as a whole, which, you know, again, is really a million different little fiefdoms have been given a directive. You, you have to make sense in this world, just like when Satya Nadella became CEO. You have to make sense in this cloud world, which is how we got, you know, Windows as a service and uh, whatever. And, you know, Windows was the one business that didn't make a lot of sense there. Um, I don't know. There's no AI story here, right? There's no, there was never a great developer story, although I, I suppose for developers writing Android apps on Windows, maybe this was a slightly better thing, I guess. But this isn't what, you know, targeting a very specific app or a mobile platform, whatever platform uh, in this day and age, maybe isn't the most common thing. Right. Unless you're an Apple guy <laughs> and then we could have a different conversation. But because Apple keeps but, that space pretty well, narrow. Right. I mean, the developers who are sticking with uh, Windows or Linux are probably web developers or some form of cross-platform something, something. And uh, yes, running an Android emulator to check out an app before you get it on an actual device is fine, but if it's it maybe was faster, not reason enough. It's not always faster. Yeah, it might not have been reason enough. They were pretty so. heavy. But yeah, yeah, throw out your theories. I mean, I we can all guess. I don't... I, I it's just hard don't. to imagine Microsoft as resource constrained, but they are. Right. That's the yeah. truth. Right. The basic argument that this doesn't show is a principal path forward and had some serious obstacles that it had a couple of years to overcome and had failed. And right. at some point, the, the VP says, I'm not hanging my career on this anymore. Let it go. I bet if you were to go back and look at the coverage of the win original Windows 11 announcement, which I guess I can't, I can't, I'm not sure I can't think of the year. It must have been 2020, June, right? And, um, that this would have been the big, biggest fee. Uh, you know, we're going to refine the UI, simpler, yada, yada. Okay, cool. Android apps. I bet, I bet that was, I bet those were the biggest changes like people talked about at the time. And the reality was not just slow to market. Remember, they didn't make the original release of Windows 11. It came out in preview oh. later that year. There's a basic gate here. If you can't get Google Play on board, you should stop. It's not Android. Yeah. Right. If you're done. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, that's, that's where people go. The yeah. company that made Windows RT should know <laughs> that something that looks like something, but is not something, not is, something. Not, is, yeah, not something. is a problem. Yep. And, yep. you know, and to exactly that point, it's like, take those very talented people who built that thing and get them working on ARM stuff because that has a better future. See, nobody, actually, nobody, that's nobody, it. nobody wants Chemrog's cornflakes. They want the <laughs> real thing. Right. Chemrog's. Chemrog's. Mmm, <laughs> good. Uh, <laughs> the... <laughs> now oh, you're cooking with fire. Um, <laughs> Vector lead oxides. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm talking about. I think that was a Robocop reference, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, there's a, uh, you just, interesting, you just brought up Windows on ARM. I mean, arguably, our Android apps would run better on Windows and ARM, right? I mean. Closer to the chipset. Yeah. Right? I, I, I know there's. I know you can target an, uh, Intel on Android. I don't know if anyone does, but I mean, there for ten seconds about ten years ago, there were in, Intel-based Android tablets you could buy. I mean, that was a thing briefly. Um, I don't know. Anyway, it's dead, and I don't know how to feel about it. I never liked it. I never used it. Um, I don't feel like most other people did. But then again, like everything else in our little part of the world, when something like this happens, you hear from every single person that loved this thing. You know, <laughs> yeah, all five of them. Yeah, you really yeah, do every yeah, time. Yeah. Of you also hear from the people who never used it but are still outraged because this is the world yeah. we live in now. We get you to get outraged get about everything. Someone should bring Microsoft to a class action lawsuit. Did you ever use this? No, but whatever. You know, <laughs> like it's it, I'm not it's, saying I'll be in the, in the lawsuit. Yeah. It's a strange, it's a strange time to be alive, but I don't know. I, I, I guess I feel ambivalence about it, except for we, anyone who has followed Microsoft for as long as we all have knows that we, there, there's a rich history of things that were presented as the biggest thing in the world. Briefly, uh, they kind of disappeared. No one talked about it for a while and then it was dead, you know, yeah, like connect and it, vision pro, you okay, know, it, it happens, you know, vision pro. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I have, Man, to throw, there's a shot. I have to throw that into every show now because it really drives I, um, people and crazy. The story I wrote about Apple canceling their uh, smart car efforts, I wrote that uh, flush with the success of Vision Pro, <laughs> Apple has decided to <laughs> scale back its more experimental. That's good. I need, that's good. I need a little subtle digs like that. Yeah. Be like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
You gotta, you gotta, it has to be subtle enough that you're like two sentences later and then the person reading it or hearing it says, wait, what? Hey. <laughs> what are you going to say? Or, or they're so in the can for Apple that they go, oh yeah, see? Oh yeah. 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 See, I told I, you. Oh, I never hear from those guys. Are there still some of those people, Leo? I don't even oh, know. Oh, there are. There are. <laughs> of course there are. I don't know where they oh, go. There's still somebody out there pining for the Watson, I'm sure. I like that the uh, in the debate, we, we're not going to talk about it, any of the Apple antitrust today, except I'm going to go on for half an hour about it right now. Um, the, the two sides of this debate are literally like prolonged, logical, legal debates about why what Apple is doing is terrible. And then the other side is saying, I, I think they should be able to do whatever they want. <laughs> and like, that's the, like literally the depth <laughs> yeah, of the argument. That's like, literally yeah. the argument, right? Yeah, there. that's it. In that, that's show. the whole argument. Yeah. yeah. You'll never find someone who could like lay out like a really logical, long winded thing that actually makes sense uh, that for what, why their behavior is okay. It's, you won't find it. Yeah. Please spend some time trying and then uh, don't email it to me because uh, I don't care. <laughs> okay. Uh, da, 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 since our last show, we've only had somehow one windows insider build to the beta channel uh, fans of the hover over the widget icon to make the stupid UI appear and slowly draw. will love this change. Uh, Microsoft is experimenting, meaning they will release in stable next week a new experience where you hover over the co-pilot button in the taskbar and it opens automatically. <laughs> so uh, we're going to drive they, usage they, by they, misclicks. Or mis that's what the edge icon did when they first pushed it out there, yes. too. If you got anywhere near that thing, it popped up on the right on every browser on your machine. Right, right. The first uh, application I wrote with Delphi, if I'm not mistaken, Borland Delphi back in the day was something that would put a UI element up. And then as you try to go click it, it would move it away so you could never reach it. That's right. And Microsoft is using that technology, uh, <laughs> except they've you know reversed it, obviously. Yeah. Um, it's, is, it's, is my mouse right? moving to the button? I'm not moving the mouse. You know, it's like you a, know like you a want Ouija to click board. This. We're here to help. <laughs> yeah. Our AI told us you wanted to click here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Our AI is named uh, Beazelbub. It was the AI that was in The Exorcist. You may remember <laughs> them I think from that, that movie. Pazuzu, if Pazuzu, I'm yeah, not exactly. mistaken. I, you want You're to get right, your you demons right. <laughs> Pazuzu, that's Pazuzu. right. Pazuzu, um, yes. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll see what happens there. But there's that's it. That was the only new. There's some fixes and whatever, but that was still it. And then uh, because I can never stop talking about earnings, I... The, the quarter, every new quarter, our next new quarter is just what, three weeks away. And, uh, and here we are still reporting on the last quarter because some of these companies have weird schedules and Dell yeah. and HP are two examples of those companies. Um, given uh, relatively speaking, how well Lenovo did, it's a little shocking to say that both HP and Dell underperformed, especially in the PC realm. So HP's revenues for that quarter were down 4.8% overall, but the personal systems business, which is what makes their PCs, down 4.1, soft demand, unfavorable mix shift. You know, you see the language. Um, most of their sales, interestingly, it's true of Dell too. Um, two thirds are to businesses, consumers are the other third. Um, you know, it will probably, they think it's going to come back in the second half of the year. So Dell well, basically I, said, sorry. I mean, the broader economic reporting is that if, unless you're in North America, everybody's in recession. Yeah. So the, you know, this thing that we were warned about this time last year, why all the tech giants clamped down was that we were going to have a late year yeah, down. It has yeah. come to pass. It's just that it looks like U.S. and Canada have done Yeah, magically escaped it, right? It might be effective governing, but nobody believes in that, apparently. So, that, well, tied to that, um, Intel and Microsoft both saw orders coming back and both reported in recent quarters, you know, we see this thing rebounding. The problem is these companies buy this stuff ahead of time, anticipating yeah. what demand is going to be. And it's possible we haven't gotten there yet, but uh, I don't know what that means for Windows or Intel, you know, over the next, say, two to three quarters. It might, you know, dip for them as well. But Dell, oh man, Dell, it's, a big <laughs> dip. it's awful. So Dell had double digit revenue drops in the quarter and the year. Uh, mm -hmm. They had double digit revenue drops, I believe, in every quarter of that year. Um, their PC business, you know, again, down horribly. And primarily um, business. They, uh, they, <laughs> they kind of, they basically, not, they didn't actually have any good numbers for this, but they basically said, we're seeing some real good demand for our AI servers and their stock shot up. Uh, they delivered one of the worst quarters, I'm sure, <laughs> in their cor corporate history. 
No, I, like, to this day, it's to AI. The you know, Twit now with AI. Exactly. And Twit AI. Yeah, you should do it right now. We should. The I I wrote this story about Dell, uh, my story, and I'm and look, I I got to be honest, I, I I'm not biased in any way, but I didn't want it to be so horrible. I was looking for some out, some way I could give them something, and it was nothing. And then I woke up in the morning and I started reading my newsfeed and all I saw was like Dell surges on AI servers. And I was like, wait, what? And I, and I thought, did I miss something? And I went back and looked at their announcement. And it's like, no, they, all they did was talk. They didn't really have any hard, any good number. Be clear, an, an AI server is what we used to call a gaming workstation. No, no, it's <laughs> no, this is for like in the data center. So Dell, you know, right. Uh, Dell like, well, not HP anymore, but Dell like Lenovo, Dell, Dell like nobody, I guess. Dell is somewhat unique. They, they have a server business, right? And they have a client PC business. Um, they, they've not really strayed from that path too, too much other than that whole VMware experiment we're not going to talk about. But, um, you know, they've, they've been pretty true to their roots, I would say, uh, overall. But I, they anticipate some great growth there. And uh, I would just say they could only get improve growth there, but <laughs> whatever. I'm, I'm trying to be nice here. I don't know. I feel bad for them. I want them to do well. So the, the top three PC makers, uh, Lenovo, uh, HP and Dell, uh, all, you know, not great. Lenovo may be the best um, of the three as far as, uh, you know, rebounding yeah. at the end of the year, I guess is the way I would say. Yeah, no, I know. I, I find it fascinating, especially what's the buy cycle right now. And yeah. You know, the push and something I have been advocated on run as like last year was a good year to buy mm -hmm. extended warranties and not replace hardware. Yeah. Just to That's... keep more, you know, gunpowder in the can there, like keep your ammunition dry. Yeah. And depending on how these companies buy things, I mean, that might or might not be good for PC makers. Um, mm -hmm. Not as good as buying new PCs, obviously. Yeah. But I just, I feel like the, um, Actually, we're going to talk about AI PCs here in a moment and a little bit of irritant there. But this whole notion of an AI PC is um, doesn't seem to be having the intended effect because the software's not there, right? Mm -hmm. well, we still are, are struggling with this notion of, you know. They're still trying to figure out what the heck they're making. That's why there's so yeah. many bloody announcements. Right. The idea that, it, it, which is funny because, you know, for a long time it was the hardware came out and then the software became possible and like behind it. Now we have a software breakthrough, the yeah. hardware for the whole time, but they're like, okay, well, how do we get this to the edge? It's like, well, we're not ready because we don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. I, I don't know when the line changed or whatever, but for the entirety of the nineties, at least, and probably beyond windows was always ahead of the hardware. You always, you never had enough hardware to run right. this thing effectively. Yeah. And at some point PCs caught up and of course, un unfortunately slash fortunately, they also became a lot more reliable. So when we flash forward to today, um, oh no, the ben, and they, it's a weird cycle. You know? Plus, the big push, and again, maybe a little off topic here, but certainly in the IT space, it's maintainable hardware. Right. It's like it's getting we're getting seeing more examples of it's easy to take every spinning piece of hardware out of a chassis, replace it all, and keep going. Exactly. Well, because we don't need faster CPUs. Like for the most yeah. part, they're lying around smoking cigarettes and playing poker anyway. <laughs> right? Like right. it's it's the spinning gear that that wears, and otherwise the machine can do the workload. What a velvet painting of poker playing mm -hmm. dogs! I, I oh, CPUs ask Copals to make it. They could do a really CPUs. good one. You probably like probably that? Yeah. Hey, That's let's uh, let's pause. I see you have a beverage, Paul. I trust there's no tequila in it. You're watching. No, there could be though. It's could a, be. Could I be. Was frescas with a. I love Agua Malone. Fresca. I am going to live. See, this is the thing. I don't need tequila when we go down. I'm going to live on uh, Jamaica and watermelon. I get a, I Apparently, I there's get a, a drink wonderful... that's the size of my head for lunch, and yeah. it's just and It's watermelon juice with strawberry. It's delicious. Yep. It's probably a little bit sugary. I like Jamaica. Yeah, I love Jamaica. That's, um, oh, so I get it. I try to get it with little or no sugar when I can. Yeah. You can always tell when, when you don't get it right. <laughs> yeah. I like, Jamaica I like needs it. Just a little of the chili. Yeah. 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 But, uh, but a watermelon strawberry is so sweet without it that it's probably just a sugar load too. Yep. Did you see they just, uh, FDA just approved a continuous glucose monitor for over the counter? Which I oh, think there you go. That's Finally, really good. I knew this. Yeah, this had to happen. Yeah, yep. that's really good. good. Uh, just approved. It'll be available this summer. The Dexcom uh, nice. style Stilo. Yeah, Dexcom. 
Yeah, they, they're they one of the in. couple. I used to I used to wear Freestyle Libres from Ab Abbott. Yeah, that's the one I had. Uh, but they right. had he had a I had to go to prescription mill to get them. <laughs> yeah, it was a pain in the butt. Yeah. I had to go to like an internet doctor. <laughs> exactly. I, I should have should doctor. have added the air quotes there at an internet doctor. You but seem like you might have diabetes, <laughs> like totally. Yeah. No, but it yeah. was it was valuable information, and I and I got tired of paying two hundred bucks a month. I don't know how much these will be. Same. Doing. No, but it was. It, but you you can test foods and see what things spike exactly. you, and it, it's 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 also it's alert. And I think this one, just reading the press release, uh, yep. automatically goes to your phone. You don't have to scan it. So that's oh, nice. nice. Okay. Yeah. Every fifteen yep. minutes, it updates. I used to enjoy that. That was like my little Star Trek moment. I would kind of leap yourself. Yeah. yeah. Boop, boop, boop. You're watching Windows Weekly. This is Paul Therott, Star Trek man, Richard Campbell, <laughs> tequila guy. Actually, tequila will be our brown liquor pick in just a bit. But before we go any farther, I hear there's a rumor afloat. There may be new Surfasi. Yes? Surfasi. 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 No, it's, it's, it is a rumor, but Windows Central is reporting they've heard that uh, Surface Pro 4 and Surface Laptop 6 will be coming uh, later this month, so only a couple of weeks away. Uh, Microsoft, annoyingly, is referring to them as its first AI PCs. And I say that is annoying because uh, Richard's using a computer, which I believe was marketed as their first AI PC. And two years before that, Microsoft released the Surface Pro 10 Another with a one. Qualcomm chip, and which they the referred to as their first AI PC. Yeah. So, Pro 9 had it first. The Pro, this, Pro 9, oh, excuse me. Yeah. The okay. Surface Studio 2 has it. Right. And so now the Pro 10, I'd be surprised if the Pro 10 didn't have it since the Pro 9 had it. Yep. So, do we ever know if it's being used? Like, would I pull up the resource monitor? Does it have a category for the, for the uh, AI processor? Nope. Can't see if it's being used. No way to know. Oh, that's interesting because it should have that. Um, if you have an Intel Core Ultra CPU in your uh, PC, you do have that. You do have an MPU entry. So, you know, CPU, GPU, et cetera, network, you know, whatever else is in there. Uh, MPU is one of the things. In fact, that was the, the demo I did correctly the first time and then botched the second time around for hands-on Windows because that computer didn't support it. But... Uh, I demonstrated how Windows Studio Effects actually triggers the MPU using a task manager. Yeah. Well, you so don't have to take my word for it because that's been lost. So <laughs> but. task manager, you know, has CPU and then I presume it has mm -hmm. a GPU column or a tab. Yep. But it, did it have an NPU tab? Yes, it did. Yep. But not anymore. It does, I should say. It still does. Well, so it, if you have an Intel Core Ultra chipset or I believe a uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon, whatever, not the one I have at home. It's like a Gen 2 or 3, whatever, but the newer one. Yeah, you'll see a, an MPU huh. entry under GPU. Cool. Um, although the ThinkPad, it's around there somewhere. The ThinkPad X1 Carbon Gen 12, I think it is, has a Core Ultra and the MPU does not show. Oh, no, no, no. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It does show up. It just doesn't ever trigger <laughs> and i don't know why it'd be really interesting but, to see um you know if you gave it a, a ai load like a yeah you know, oh that's what and, i did and, yeah so windows studio it effects and, it actually yeah. triggers the mpu you can see okay. it hit yeah so when you run things like um background blur in photos or background removal in paint you can see the cpu and the gpu a little bit will you know give a little bump but the mpu doesn't go anywhere because those features do not use the mpu but the uh windows studio effects so yeah. At the Qualcomm event months ago, they said they were going to have, what was their new platform that it was going to have? Yeah, Elite X, X Elite or X no, Elite that's X, not Snapdragon what it was Elite called. X. It was something, something catchy. <laughs> something catchy. Well, I'm talking about the Windows chipset. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about something else. Uh, okay. I'll have to look it up because I, Maybe. yeah. AI uh, enabled chip. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it was only well, for phones. I don't know. Well, all of their chips for the past few years have been have had an MPU, right? I mean, they've been doing this. And right. then uh, I believe the ex the current, as of today, Snapdragon chips are for Windows, whatever that's called. It might be a 8X Gen 3, I believe, also has an MPU. Yeah. It must. And then uh, Microsoft came out, of course, with their variant, the SQ1 and 2, and I at least one or if not both of those had an MPU. Um, Was it Cairo? Then, uh, Cryo? Was it Cryo? Cryo. Was that that sounds like the the like technical name of the underlying yeah like that platform was the or something. Platform. Yeah. yeah like you know like yeah. Adreno and all that yeah yeah okay I think so this is sounds the one though this is it right the 
this elite well the, one. so the new one the one that's coming out this spring sometime may ish is i believe it's either a snapdragon x elite or snapdragon elite x i can't remember the exact name but this is the one that's supposed to be on par with the intel stuff from a performance perspective uh, wow and they did a uh, some kind of a benchmark thing at Mobile World Congress, I think, yeah, where they showed that it trounced Intel in AI operations. Um, Interesting. Using, uh, what's that uh, graphic, uh, stable uh, diffusion and um, GIMP. Good. So Good. Yeah, yeah awesome. that's good. I mean, you know, I, I think all phones by now have some sort of yeah. machine language processing and... Uh, Yep, your desktop should too. I think if you're for future proof, I, uh, I, you know, so in, in photos, the app in Windows, the the big feature at M5 is something called generative erase, and it's like, so you oh, mean yeah. to tell me that that's my right. three thousand dollar computer can now erase backgrounds as easily as my phone does? That, that's great. <laughs> you know, that's I mean, they have to do it, right? But I, I, duh, you know, yeah. like of course you, it should. Work. You have to pitch it, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. This is not a breakthrough. This is a catch up. Right. Right. Um, just briefly, this uh, Surface story uh, also included the rumor of something called AI Explorer, which um, I hate to use this word, but is described as a blockbuster AI experience that will separate <laughs> AI PCs. For, I know. So it's I did not, not a my blockchain words. AI experience. I'll it's be not it. my okay. words. Um, blockbuster. It, blockbuster. Uh, mm. Yeah, you know, because it's like the 90s when you go pick up VHS. Um, it's described as an advanced co-pilot. Uh, which I hope means it does something local, right? Uh, Built-in history, timeline, uh, et cetera, works across apps, uh, search for previously open conversations, documents, web pages, and image. This may be the thing that ties together the co-pilot as we know it today in the cloud and these capabilities we've been talking about but haven't seen locally like uh, Microsoft will be doing for businesses with um, co-pilot for one drive, <laughs> so many names. Um, where you could create kind of a personal co-pilot of sorts, um, where you could you know quickly find information in your own data stores, whatever they might be. Maybe. Can't come quickly enough, I can tell you that. Um, but then again, if they announce this at this, if they have an event, say late March, and they actually announce not just the hardware, but some hardware capabilities that will be coming to Windows 11, hopefully across the board, or at least to AI PCs across the board, um, they have to do something to drive sales of these devices because right now I don't believe they're making all that much of a dent, you know, unfortunately. Well, we need a workload. We need something that you absolutely yep. have to have that depends on it. You right. know? Right. Yeah. It's not even a, I wouldn't even call it a killer app. I just need an app. <laughs> you know, it, it, could it be a, a a thing? Something? You know, back in the day, nothing put the IBM PC on a ta on a desk faster than Lotus One Two Three. Yes, you know, like when you have the app that people want, That's they right. will buy your gear. Yep. Yeah. Right. They'll be the path to your door. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I think the problem is, you know, uh, PCs are so mature as a platform that we um we just don't think about this too much anymore. And you know, as we discussed earlier, stable works forever, et cetera. Yeah. And I, frankly, you know, it's not helping matters that the uh, most popular personal computing platform, the phone, is already doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, not not exactly right, but um, no. but I, most of us are on our phones, and we can do a lot of this stuff on our phones. Yeah. Uh, Show uh, us a PC caliber workload. Yeah, something yeah. that takes advantage of that hardware and that yeah. big screen, and yeah, those productivity features we expect. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. Right. Where it's like, yeah. you need to get to a place where it's like, oh, I want to do this. I'll wait till I can get to my PC. You know, look, I'm a, I'm a writer. I like having a big screen. I like having a big word processing document yeah, but, of some but kind. Once whatever. you're past an eight and a half by 11, you don't care, right? Like if you can see it. No, page, I, but, no, but what I meant was like, um, uh, for me, I'm not going to use Copilot or anything else to write a story, obviously. I, I have never to the second used it to even jumpstart something or to, you know, anything like that, but I'm not a normal uh, mainstream user. Right. And if you can get AI that can write for you, mm -hmm. uh, do you even need a big screen anymore? <laughs> you know, what's yeah. the point? Like we used to David Pogue and everyone would joke about all the toolbars and it would squeeze the, the word window down to this little poster stamp in the middle. Yeah. And it's like, you know what, with AI, maybe that's all we need. <laughs> I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying, you know, for other people, maybe nope. just saying it's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, 
uh, a couple of AI stories. There could be a lot more. My God, AI is happening so fast. I, I, I'm is it or mind. is it just being talked about so fast? Yeah. I, I don't mean, see a lot of product. I see a lot of announcements. When I first started writing news back in the late 90s, I let me see if I can come up with this. The tagline for the newsletter I used to send out was news and information, no fluff. And the right. idea was that I was only going to focus on the things that were important. And I have a hard time now understanding what's important and what's not yeah. important because there's so much of it. Sometimes when there's a tsunami, uh, you know, you can't, yeah, the, can't, can't you focus. You know the thing about a tsunami? One story, right? Yeah, a lot of point. water. It comes a lot of water. Out. Yeah, it ends. <laughs> the good news it's about a tsunami is it ends. Yeah. This isn't ending oh, yet. Um, I'm writing all these preparatory, I'm making all these preparatory shows for get ready for this kind of co-pilot and that kind of co-pilot. And how do you deal oh with God. this? But I mean, I'm sick to death of them too, but it's like, I can only prep you so far. Then we need a product. You need a, um, a co-pilot fatigue episode, oh. frankly. <laughs> no, I, I mean it. And maybe right? all of them. Do you, you remember with Chat GPT fatigue. got lazy? Are you talking about the AI getting fatigued or you? No, no, no. <laughs> no, I, I just, uh, uh, as Microsoft customers, yeah, keep, just, you know, keeping track of, trying to understand where the value is, which yeah. we might want to do where, um, was bad enough two, three months ago. Right. I mean, it's worse today. It's going to be worse in two months. I mean, it's... It's astonishing. Do you think though that we'll eventually the end game is it 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 they stop calling it out and it's just everywhere and and it's just is it's yeah. It's yeah, yeah yeah functionality right? But yeah, that was a, they're talking talking to us about an Azure AI, you know, or, and I'm like, so is this just advisor powered with AI? He's already got here's me the, here, here's, here's, the is going to be better. Awesome. I think most Azure users, for lack of a better term, admins, whatever you want to call them. Yeah would agree with the statement. Uh, the Azure AI we need is the one that uh, actually configures the thing correctly. Yes. So I don't have to go through that stupid so UI. Do it. Yes. You know, right. That would be, that would be some AI. Could you do that? Yeah. You know, it's, and this is what we're up against. And, and I think it's part of the reason we're hear, hearing so much hype is because this may just be a feature. It's not a well, problem. It, yeah. And, and look, this is something we actually would would have have, I should say, have talked about from time to time. We kind of do the inside baseball thing here and there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure people are familiar with this notion that, you know, we think of Microsoft as this giant, you know, used to be like the Death Star, you know, this giant yeah. entity, as if they were somehow working in concert, you know, uh, as if the Windows and Office teams ever liked each other, let alone work together <laughs> in any meaningful way. Um, I can assure you that almost never happened. No. But I mean, it's just amazing. Like people think of them as like this concerted front. Yeah. It's not. It's, it's this was Hanselman's been. line, right? We are not organized enough to be as evil as you think we are. <laughs> yeah, right. Everyone knows the funny thing with the uh, the all the guns. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The the problem with that image was only that it 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 overstated the fact that most of those people would just ignore the other groups. They weren't pointing guns. They were just ignoring yeah. them. Like that, you know. So uh, the point for this particular conversation is that inside Microsoft right now there are a lot of teams and people positioning themselves mm -hmm. to make sure that they ride this wave and come out on the other side of it ahead. Not everything they're doing right now is going to pass, right? I mean, some of this stuff is going to get stuck or, or fail or whatever. And, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a company wide. This is the one way they are concerted. They're all working toward the same end for themselves, <laughs> right? Not necessarily for the best interests of cross pollination of technologies, et cetera, whatever. Um, so there's, there's, it's confusing for us and it is, but I, I bet it's confusing inside Microsoft right now too, because they're, everyone's scrambling yep. to get their little piece of beach, you know? Yeah. Mm. Well, and, and, and budget time is upon us, right? The year end is, <laughs> yes. new, which means all right. the planning happens in April and May. So your positioning is about how you're going to ask for money for the next yep. Yeah, and by the way, uh, builds coming up in May, and if you think yep. that thing's going to be filled with new Windows features and you know developer APIs for Windows, think again. Um, it's going to be a lot of stuff. It's going to—I mean, I don't know percentages. Richard probably can't even say anything. He probably knows exactly what's happening, but there is some. Uh, there's going to be some preponderance of AI. It's going to be—you know—it will be like the AI build or whatever. Um, not that they call oh, it. Like and they, I do feel like these, because MVP Summit is literally next week. They yeah. are, they test a lot of build material on the MVP. Yeah, there you go. There so. you go. Yeah, it's all coming together, sort of. We'll see where they are. Like, yeah. This time last year, you told us, just watch this spot. 
Well, it's next year. Yeah, and we're watching the spot. <laughs> You'll be yeah. watching for a while now. That they spot should just, just blow up a dam and let it just wash over everybody. It's going to be, <laughs> it's gonna oh, be brutal. Okay. They got a good volcano. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We have a good volcano here too. Uh, How's that going? Yeah, and it's doing a good thing. It's going good. Um, everyone here complains about ash covering everything as if it were snowing ash. And that's not been my experience, but all I've seen are sunny, clear days and it's just as dusty as ever. And I have no idea what you're talking about. It's just, has the sunset changed? That's usually the thing. It does it's turn a, a brilliant red on some days, yeah. but uh, you know, we also have pollution. So it's kind of hard to say. Um, you know, what's the better effect on that? I do like being west of the volcano. So we're largely, yeah, not we are, uh, technically, South, we are you? technically west of the volcano, but just east? west. Is it, is that why? Or? Good east, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm everyone here is very dramatic to, about the, about the ash, well, you know, going to Bob. because about above 80, everyone complains about the heat. It, the ash happens and it's like, oh my God, we have to shovel the driveway. No, you don't. It's not like that. I want a bumper sticker that says Ash Happens. That's good. It's <laughs> yeah. like the last days of Pompeii. Right. right. <sighs> All right. Take After a break. A, um, Sip some Jamaica. <laughs> Going to take a little ad break. More AI coming up. Don't go away. You're watching Windows Week. Look, he, he did it. Mm. What flavor is that? It's Ash. <laughs> Delicious <laughs> Ash. You know, I just, it's so funny you should say that. I just read a story because I like to think about the Roman Empire several times yeah, a day. Who doesn't? Just read this is America, and this is all we can think about these days. The gladiators, <laughs> after a long day fighting lions and so forth, would drink basically a sport drink that was had ash in it for the electrolytes. Okay, yeah. So that may or may not have been good for you. It kind of clears you out, I guess. I guess uh, you don't want to inhale it. Don't That's put a bad. lot of ash in it. Yeah, just a little ash. Yeah, it looks like the volcano Popo is like southeast of of Mexico yeah. City, but definitely on the on the airline approaches. So that's gonna yes, be right. Oh, but which, by the way, so funny you say that. When we sit out on our balcony here, we watch the airplanes come in, and they follow a very well two, depending north or south. Uh, we what we typically see in front of us are the planes landing, and mm -hmm. we they follow exact patterns and it's consistent yeah. and it's every 60 seconds or whatever safe and this week that well two weeks now probably completely different what we see now with the planes taking off from the airport because they've switched up the routes ah. because of the volcano yeah, yeah that's true pointing they're, the they're pointed another way yep isn't that exciting you do not hey, want to you know that. we don't have a lot to look at so really this for us is, really is kind retirement. of a, we're obsessed we sit on the porch and notice which yeah, that plane's uh, it's from dallas that's yeah. a dallas plane uh yep that's, oh, where, see, that's who we are is that a 787 no, we have an app you can just hold you hold up oh, the, you app don't even tells need the flight where it's from no this one's yeah. from peru this one's from you know that's actually yeah, good i like it, it. it, it tail is good yeah. Well, you can't. They're not that close. But you can see it. Yeah. <laughs> but, Flight aware or whatever. Yeah. You can see it. Yeah. 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 It's neat. All right. On we go with yes. the Cho. So you may recall there was a Microsoft engineer who raised a stink. Uh, I think it was late last year about AI and all the problems and no one's paying attention to me and yada, yada, yada. You may be surprised to discover that person still works at Microsoft. Although I have to see after uh, say after his uh, CNBC interview this week, that might be the end of that. Mm. Um, he has gone public with Microsoft's attempts to prevent him from complaining or talking or uh, got the whatever. weird parallels with Google's guy too, doesn't it? My yes. Goodness. Yep. Yep. So he uh, he had warned Microsoft about this yeah, late last year. Uh, they refused to take down the tool or alter it. He kept generating horrific images. I'm not going to go into what they are exactly. It doesn't really matter. But um, and they were like, yep, I don't care. Everything's fine. You know, and, and this is one of those, you know, deals where there are people who ethically sort of feel like we need better safeguards in place. And right. Microsoft, who has this kind of strategic imperative to get the stuff going as quickly as possible. Yeah. And I, and I, I appreciate and I've certainly heard from many corners that they are feeling like leadership's being a little too cavalier that they that they're moving awfully fast and with less caution than necessary but violent images is the american way i know well so okay so for example today i tried to use copilot to create an image for a story about uh, epic games and apple uh, apple has again killed epic games developer account 
again. Yeah. So I prompted it with something to the tune of, I want to see characters from Fortnite attacking the Apple logo. And it refused. It said, no, we're not going to have this conversation. Right. <laughs> Which I said, I'm actually, I'm actually paying for this conversation. We are going to have it. So I rewarded it slightly. And then it, it just did one that they weren't really attacking it, but they were just kind of jumping around. That's fine. Right. <laughs> it is weird. Uh, every time it has refused to do something, there was one I tried to do. It was like a creative robot army attacking a city. Nope. Create a robot army moving into the city or marching into the city. No problem. You know, so yeah. uh, this engineer, interestingly, he talks about these kinds of things. Like there's a drug reference thing. He's been able to do a bunch that CNBC could replicate. Right. If you typed in the letters, uh, the numbers 420, it would do whatever. Um, it Microsoft puts on a block and CNBC just wrote the words out or it wrote the numbers out as words and it worked fine. Right. And so what this reminds me of is the TSA, let's respond to yesterday's security worry today. And, right. We're, we're, we're always, yeah, we're going to do one offs and, oh, they attacked us this way. Uh, okay. Let's fix that one thing, you know, and I'd like to think we could maybe have a technology, I don't know, call it AI that maybe could look at this stuff a little more heuristically perhaps and go after types of prompts and not individual specific prompts, but I, we were early enough here that I feel like we're literally responding to one of people can right. go well, to it AI. Almost feels like intentionally inferior solutions. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's right. That's right. Like in the early days of antivirus, these things would target specific known viruses. It was very <laughs> easy, but of course these attacks got more sophisticated, especially in the beginning of the 2000s when we had all the different security attacks that, you know, in part led to trustworthy computing, et cetera. Yeah. And you basically, not you, Microsoft has to, over time, develop these things that, what, like we have today, they look at the characteristics of something mm -hmm. and assign a score, essentially, and say, based on our determination, we believe that this thing is malicious or could be, or... I gotta also imagine getting people complaining about being blocked, right? Like, it's gotta work both ways. I, like I said, I, I gave a really silly example, but I, this is now maybe the third or fifth or whatever time this has happened to me where it literally kind of came back in kind of a grumpy way, you know, like as if I had asked it to do something wrong. I'm not actually, I'm not asking to generate sexually explicit imagery here, idiot. I'm, I'm just, I'm creating a graphic for an article for a technical news story. It's not a, I'm not creating like a, a manga comic here. Yeah, it's like not, not a plan to take over the village. No. And I, and, but I, I can explain that in plain English to you and you may or may not agree, but I, there's no, nothing I can say to a co-pilot that's going to make it agree. They put in these hard blocks, right. That are very simplistic. Yeah. So anyway, I, uh, right. will probably lost his job over going on TV. I, yeah, I think so. This was maybe, and maybe this was the calculus. But at least he's not saying it's sentient and trying to kill us all. That's perfect. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. And of course, uh, Google also had, uh, famous problems, infamous problems with their image generation capabilities in uh, Gemini a couple of weeks ago, I think now. Yep. And uh, I don't think that's ever come back, by the way. It will, right? I mean, they they yeah. said at the time they would bring it back at some point, but um, not no. yet. But these are these are the battles of a, these are the growth battles of a product. Like, it's, yeah. this is not even weird. Like, duh. Yes. And, and yeah, it, the challenge will be a company who's incented to provide is many services to as many people as possible, trying to throttle themselves in, yeah. you know, we're nowhere near discussing legislation and perhaps where this, this is where this engineer wanted to go, but that's right. That's a tricky piece of legislation to push through too. Yeah. I mean, Microsoft's holding pattern strategy here is the same thing as Apple and Google when it comes to protecting their app store monopolies. They just want to make sure keep this going as long as you can stall, can stall, stall, high. you know, but I don't know how you could globally define a violent image any more than you can globally define pornography, right? Isn't the current yeah. case law for pornography? I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> yes. So how do you, what's the prompt for that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, how do you train AI to be able to come to that determination, right? It knows it when it sees it. Yeah. I don't know we're away, away from that. Uh, yeah. And of course this is moving quick, so it'll probably be April, but as of today, <laughs> Um, it'll yeah. be announced in April. We don't know when it'll show. <laughs> right. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is. We do, we do live in interesting times. Um, yeah. We, you it's, know, arguably, Paul, we always have. It's just a nice. Yeah, well, but my God, it's, it has it escalated, right? I mean, we've had some down times news from a news cycle perspective. There's no doubt yeah. about it. But Oh, no, you're waxing poetic for the happy old days. Yeah. yeah. 
So I, I kind of uh, previewed this by mistake earlier in the show, but I, I mentioned this notion that Copilot is suffering from this uh, matrix of features issue because it's implemented in so many different places that you kind of get different features in different places, depending on what we're looking at. So, for example, last week, Microsoft very quietly announced um, those new custom GPTs, right? The mm-hmm. uh, travel planner, uh, fitness uh, planner, et cetera. Um, it's on the web version. I th- think they were in the mobile versions. They're not in Copilot for Windows. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why. Different team? Um, I don't know if they're in the Edge sidebar because I wouldn't touch Edge with your computer, but Microsoft Edge uh, (laughs) did. Well, actually, I have to, unfortunately, for the book. And uh, for my computer? That's weird. No, not in your computer. Yeah, yeah, well, I need (laughs) clean screenshots. The point is, (laughs) Edge is terrible, and uh, it has a sidebar that has Copilot in it, including the image capabilities. And it just... Yeah. And it just picked up two um, AI uh, related features. I, I will say I'm not a big fan of browser sidebars, but there is an interesting yeah. side by side case, right? To use that Stevie Batish uh, language for you're browsing the web and you've got this thing on the side that can maybe summarize for you, et cetera. Um, I, there, there's a case to be made there. So they added a video highlights feature that among other things will create automatic summaries of the video you're watching cool now that makes sense something that the yeah it's great you get out for a long time there have to be there has to be a transcription right it's working off the text not of it's not actually sitting there listening ahead in the video it's it's you know grabbing the text that's fine you know youtube generates uh these things automatically i think vimeo might be the other one um neat that's a great idea and if it's done correctly with timestamps, right you could jump and it is in this case i should say you can jump forward to that point so you can kind of read through the summary and say oh that's the thing i want to listen to i mean how many videos have you watched where it's like here's how you do something it's 20 minutes long thing you want to watch is 30 seconds yeah <laughs> you know i didn't want to watch a video in the first place but for some reason this is the only thing that comes up yep. in uh, search results these but does days it right have to watch it i mean how does it know what's in there it uses the, the transcription, so automatic ah, transcription. Ah, so it's fast. That's good. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to wait for it, and it, like I said, it will link to the point in the because the the timestamps in the transcription, right? So that's nice. I think this that, is that's hugely that's, useful because most I think so. YouTube videos are yeah. full of fluff. Not like yeah. this show, by the way. No, not at all. No, I haven't been backpedaling for thirty minutes. It's fine. Um, yeah, or treading water, or whatever the term we is. We are talking about the death of the inline ad. <laughs> Um, another capability you're seeing across Copilot, and this is in Windows Copilot, uh, is screenshot integration, right? And so the idea there is you see something on screen, so you click the screenshot button, you can circle it or draw a picture or whatever, and, and it will tell you what it is, right? And so there's things like literally you might see a weird plant and be like, I don't know, what is that plant? I want one of those plants. Like, how do I get that plant? I need to know the name, right? That's cool. Or uh, they always use these like in, uh, influencer type things. Like like there would be an influencer on earth who didn't mention what the sweater was she was wearing. Uh, you could circle the sweater and it would say, oh, that's a, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know clothes. So I can't tell you what it is. But the, uh, you know, whatever brand of clothes, you know, that kind of thing. So that's useful too, right? Like that's, uh, that's something we've all run into. You're on the web or whatever. I don't know. What is this thing? What am I looking at? You know? Yep. Uh, that's fine. That's a good fit. That's a good feature. Cool. That's cool. Uh, and that works in Windows. Like I said, that one works in Windows Copilot as well. I should make this. No, I shouldn't. I already have enough terribleness in my life. Anyway, the matrix of features, the matrix of Copilot features.com, you know, try to keep track of this thing. Uh, watch. Constantly shifting. Yep. 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 And uh, we've been talking about this one for months, I think, but Microsoft did talk about Copilot uh, for OneDrive uh, coming this spring. They're only talking commercial accounts. So it's worker school accounts, right? Uh, right. With a commercial license, right? But obviously it's coming to consumers at some point. And then uh, Copilot is also, I was, this was one of the ones I was like, wait, didn't they already say this? But Copilot is coming to the uh, Microsoft 365 app on uh, mobile as well. So hmm. whatever. Well, that, but that makes it four or five. Mobile? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in there at least, right? I mean, it's, Pretty, you know, they, they're going to stick this thing everywhere, um, yep. like an alien probe. You know, I guess Kev Brewer is suggesting we call this Copilot Corner. Yeah, nice. so they mean the show or the the like the episode, just like a little bit <laughs> within the show. And oh, now, Copilot Corner. it's and time now, for a Copilot Corner. Corner. Here's Copilot this week. Nobody puts my Copilot in the corner. Copilot, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, we just you know, the Copilot Corner just be rattling off the latest set of names. 
Right. Oh my God. Just seriously, keeping track of this stuff is, is yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. It is going to get worse. It's straight up. There's just no way around this. Um, get used to it. Welcome to my world. You know, I, I dealt, like I said, I dealt with this with for years with Microsoft 365, more recently with Teams specifically. This is going to be gonna keep possibly out. exponential, <laughs> you know, yeah. we'll, we'll see. I just think, I, I feel like every day I wake up, there could be a new co-pilot feature, you know? I think you, it was, you just don't know its name. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, co-pilot uh, for finance. Yeah. This have you have you heard have you heard of this before? Are you familiar with this? Um, I know about Copilot for sales. Like the yeah. what's interesting is that the announcements from Lamana, who's the power platform guy, right? right. So you know they because rather than from some of the dynamics guys, because normally finance you think about AX and GP and like all those products that Microsoft acquired has been unifying under a SaaS umbrella, right? And the ERP side of that especially needs a copilot. Like there's a legit Mm -hmm. use for an interface to help navigate through resource planning, enterprise resource planning. Like that's a thing without a doubt. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the finance is, if the fact that it's fitting into the sales and, and service, that's more on the sort of team Z power platform sort of assembly side rather than dynamic side, but they're all pretty closely related. Yeah. It's um, dynamics is probably the least well understood part of Microsoft 365 and other SAP. ERP when you want to think, when you think cash cow, like, yeah, right. Cause they're, they are so permanent. Once a business commits to one of those things, that is yep. a permanent stream of revenue for Microsoft. Yeah. You're in there forever. And it's ever and ever. Yeah. So Copilot for finance is actually a superset of Copilot for Microsoft 365 or it will be whenever it comes out. Um, they haven't announced pricing, but obviously when you look at a Copilot for Microsoft 365 commercial, I think it's 29.99 per month, right? Per user. So it will be more than that. But then again, you only need this for that team. And uh, this is actually a part of the business where I could say, yeah, okay. Like this is this. Yeah, this is one huge. that will need the co-pilot capabilities, right? Especially when you start dipping, even you start thinking about CRM, yeah. ERP, uh, some of the other dynamic stuff mm -hmm. and co-pilot's ability to see into the graph. Yeah. Like, I want to, and, then, the and maybe help you over. visualize it right in a way yeah. that makes sense for whatever the messages you're Portraying. I, I you, suddenly I have a really good mechanism for assessing who had who had the most effort in terms right. of materials and contact with a customer. When yeah, you and, and who was just playing solitaire the whole time. Yeah, um, that would be right. the other side of that graph. Who's relaying <laughs> yeah. emails? Who's yeah. making the phone calls? Who's right. been on the chat? Who wrote that document? Who you know all of the pieces that go into closing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like you now have a beautiful record. The joke, of course, is you always had the beautiful record. Out. Well, but okay. So it's the point of the Microsoft cool. graph was you have all these data silos and you pull it yeah. together. The trick is what do you do with it at that point? Well, how, you, how do you service it? That doesn't immediately scream. Yeah, that really? doesn't, right. Doesn't require a 30 inch display at a hundred percent, you know, scaling. So no, you can see and, all the, and, and two high powered lawyers to protect yourself from the suits, right? Like yeah, it's, right. it's instantly creepy when you start pushing on this yep. data. Yeah. So uh, through natural language. I mean, look, ultimately what these people are looking for are very specific answers to very specific questions. Yeah. And I, this is the, I, to me is the, the point of AI. We have this body of data, which is either the internet or in this case, a corporation's data and you need now. Okay, good. We have the data, but we have need to make sense of it. And, um, you know, you know <laughs> this is really, a, this, is a, this is a product that exists because Microsoft could not figure out search. I, I I can't disagree with that. <laughs> so it's a, yeah. Like, okay. Now, you know, really, because what you, what are you expecting this thing to be able to do? This large language model with its ability to navigate across the data state and, it, right. and effectively index all these things. It's going to be able to consolidate the information that none of their search tools have been able to do. I, uh, this morning, I, so later in the show, I'm going to mention uh, Star Office, right? The old Sun Microsystems oh, wow. product that they purchased, right? Yeah. Openoffice.org and LibreOffice, right? Which is kind of the one of the forks of that that still exists and it's very good, whatever. But uh, I wrote about this stuff uh, back when when Sun purchased that Star, whatever the name of the company was, Star Office, essentially, uh, back in 1999, I think it was. I I wrote about it, right? And and this stuff is still out there in the world, but it's also on my OneDrive. And right. I wanted to go find what I had written about this thing, and I searched in File Explorer and got nothing. And then I went to OneDrive on the web and I got more, it was better, but again, but it's so disconnected. 
And what I would like, and this is my dream for Copilot for OneDrive, is to say, I need to see a summary of everything I've written about this product mm-hmm. in chronological order with links to the originals, you know, as needed, so I can get a, a picture of what happened over time. Because look, not only was this 25 plus years ago in some cases, I've written a hundred thousand stories since then. I don't remember everything. Yeah. I, you know, it, it, it I you know, I need that. So it's nice to find things. They're out of order, right? Yeah. It's you can go in and read them, which I did do, but I spent time on this, right? And um, this is the type of time saver I think that this type of thing will. And this, I'm talking about something very specific, obviously, but everyone in whatever job function they have has these very specific needs. And I think this co-pilot finance one is a great example of something that I, I couldn't care less about personally. But when I look at what they want to do with it, yeah. Like I that certain yeah. audiences are going to ask about, like it becomes yes. very, important. and it will make their lives better. No, no doubt about it. Doubt. Yep. Just don't waste Stop wasting time on the unimportant stuff because you're trying to, uh, you know, find that needle in the haystack yeah. of what you're actually looking for. You only have to find one needle. Yep. Um, so Microsoft uh, filed a motion to dismiss parts of that New York time copyright, uh, suit, not sweet. <laughs> Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, spelling is hard. Uh, so, I don't know. I don't want to talk about this too, too much. I, I just want to point out they compared AI to a Betamax machine and said, you know, the court, the Supreme Court ruled that Betamax was fine. So AI is fine. And it's like, boop, 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 boop. hold on a second. <laughs> so there was a, there was a, a Betamax wasn't made to violate copyright. It was made to time shift. And though it could be used for infringing uses, it had other uses that were substantial and considered to be more substantial. And that's why it was found to be fair use. I, I, I think this is a, uh, this is a dangerous um, yeah, limb for, for Microsoft to go out. Yeah. On um, because I, a, they've misrepresented a court ruling to a court yeah. <laughs> and I'm yeah. sorry, but Basically, I don't mean to say they're actually good at. Uh, yeah. I, look, I don't respect these people necessarily on a lot of levels, but I think their ability to go back and look at uh, precedent is pretty good. And uh, even though an individual judge or whomever might not remember exactly the details of any given case, uh, I can assure you they have teams of people that could look that up for them and do. And I don't know that misrepresenting something like that is such a smart idea. So um, the debate about whether AI is, you know, fair use, et cetera, et cetera, remains. Um, did I talk? I Did I mention the AI stole my homework uh, story yet? Did I I even (laughs) mention this? No. So somebody wrote me, somebody from the Netherlands wrote me last week and said, uh, hey, I don't know if you know this, but uh, you're cited as the number one source of information for an AI article about uh, Mozilla. Wow. Really? So I went and looked at it. And um, there is a, uh, there's a, I'd never heard of this service. It was called Perplexity AI. I I use it. And I'm a subscriber. Okay. So one of the things they do is they create uh, news summaries so they create a news feed, mm-hmm. an all AI generated, right? So the story about Mozilla reorging uh, cited seven sources. It was eight paragraphs long, and my article was the source of the first two paragraphs. Uh, long story short, uh, this was not a very smart uh, use of AI in the sense that it was uh, the type of thing like a lazy blogger would write. It was just like I saw a blog post and I reworded it and I put it on my blog, and you know, I, you know, that's what a lot of blogging is, frankly, right? So. It was a basic rewording of what I had written. The thing that made it especially dumb, though, is that my article quoted from a Mozilla memo, and it mixed and matched my language with Mozilla's language to create a kind of a narrative. And it was like, oh, boy, this is not particularly smart, you know. And so I kind of walked away with this. I can't not on some extreme side necessarily, but knowing this would happen someday. Right. Not sure how long it would take to see something very explicit like this. And not being super impressed with it, but what was you know, the search the term? Things- I, I want to try it here because I use mm. so the Arc. So I can give you your favorite yeah, browser. Okay. It's your fault. Uh, Arc. Fault. Yeah, it's your fault because you got me into Arc. This is what Arc <laughs> uses, and Arc on the iPhone is a is a really not a browser. It's more of a search engine. So what was the? Yeah, search let me terms? find it. So the 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 well, it wasn't a search. So I. Because no, no, but I know what I know what they I know what they did. So, so you know, they, okay, so it's called Mozilla refocuses on AI. Okay, is the is so, the, their story for lack of a better term, right? So um, what it has is, and I think this, by the way, is great, but it also is terrible for people like you. That you could right. do a regular search if I press go. This is the uh, iOS app. They don't have one for Android or uh, 
Windows yet. Sorry, is this this is perplexity? This this is Arc. Oh, Arc, right. But it uses perplexity. You can actually have it use something else. Oh, I got you. And okay. what it does actually didn't use. Yeah, it comes up and just gives it right. Exactly. It makes a website it, it, for you. Right. Right. I don't know if this is what you saw, but when I do a search like this, this is what I get. Now this did not. So I, in I, the I, perplexity AI version of the story, the first two paragraphs had a little uh, subscript or superscript, whatever that a footnote. You know, pointing to to uh, my URL, right? Yeah, and these don't. Um, but maybe that was yeah, it's a little different. But different, the yeah. so. Look, that from a content creator's perspective, which, you know, I am. Uh, this, I mean, this is taking from other people. Times of India, it's tech taking crunch, and not tech directing mecca. you there. That's yeah. the, the, and this is a problem, right? So uh, when we talk about VCRs, for example, like the the or Datamax, whatever, you know, one of the issues there is, um, well, they're stealing the content, and it's like, well, I was going to watch the content anyway. I'm just time shifting it. It's like, okay, uh, but there were ads around the content. Oh, wow. And those ads were what paid for it were part of what paid to make this thing make sense or whatever. Right. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a, there is a debate to be had there, but um, in this case, it's like, you know, it, it, it stole for me. I, you know, or it just, it did a word regurgitation thing. And um, yes, it, there's a little hyperlink down in there that you could find. And for me and seven other publications, but no one reading that article is going to go to any of those things. They, they're going to read the thing and be done. They're going to move on. Right. Yeah. And, um, and you know, that's the concern. And it's completely legitimate. What they're doing, though, is responding. Well, this is, I understand what they're doing. And by the way, I know you, you like Arc on Windows, which I try and I don't, it's not really. Yeah, it's not there yet. Yeah, 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 the yeah. Mac you, Oh, speaking of which, I sent you a, I did send both of you, by the way. I, I got hope, it. Or you, will you. Send, you have yes. not got it. And yeah. yeah, I got yeah, it. Right. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, that's how I know what Arc's like on Windows now. They had a yeah, not as a, good. Like a, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not. It's yes, far yes. far from the Mac version. Yeah, but this is Arc on on the iPhone, and right. really, what they're doing, I think, a couple of things. First of all, you can't make a browser on the iPhone yet that isn't right. WebKit right. underneath the hood, Safari under the hood. WebKit. So what yeah. they really have done is they've made it. It's a search tool, and you search for what right. you're looking for. You can pull up a regular search and have the be mm -hmm. in the browser but i like this browse for me feature from a point of view yes. of a user it's it's what you want it's the, yep. just the facts that's exactly from right. the point of view that's of a exactly content right. creator it's your worst nightmare and i understand that yep yeah I, listen i will see how this plays out i i'm i'm not quite old enough that i'm comfortable with how my career is coming to a screeching halt but it's uh, <laughs> i know you know you and i are at the end of our uh, it's yeah, our it's range. Range. <laughs> like it's a little uh, maybe, too soon. You know, five more years would have been good. <laughs> so we'll time. see we'll see but um we'll see what happens it's just it's kind of interesting i uh, look this is this is the debate of our era <laughs> it just is i you know and we'll see we'll see what if anything comes out of all this I don't yeah know. yeah um and it does, if I arc also on the desktop, we'll use perplexity. Um, but yeah. I think it's most okay. useful. Okay. The I, the, you know what? I obviously having read up on arc and written about arc, I would have seen that, but I didn't, it didn't mean anything to me. Register. In the same yeah. way that, um, oh boy, who we're going to talk about anthropic uh, soon. Uh, oh, I think it's Bra brave, I believe, in their AI, if I'm not mistaken. Anthropic is one of their AI yeah, sources. Claude. Or whatever, yeah, Claude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Claude is uh, brand new. Let me see. Yeah. So when I first see these things, it's like, I don't, these, these words don't mean anything to me, but now it's two seconds later. And now I know more about it because things have happened, right? This is what, this is how fast this moves. Um, I'm looking to it see. It is disturbing oh, and it is. frightening to me to see how awesome that arc yeah. looks on the Mac. So yeah, mm -hmm. you can use, this is arc on the Mac and you can use perplexity. Yeah. I actually use a uh, Kagi, which, K-A-G-I, uh, which also does an AI. Thing. Remember, I liked okay. Neva, and then they went out of business. Yep. Yeah, they got yeah. yeah. Then that was a uh, former Google guys, right? Yeah. Trying to make a yeah. like a paid play. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't mind paying a for a search uh, if I uh, have privacy and if right. it, if it works as well, and if I don't have works. ads. Yeah. But um, so perplexity is like a uh, Chat GPT, where you pay twenty bucks a month for a okay full use of it. Yeah. And yeah, works yeah. first, then. All those other things. Yeah. Yeah. And that seems to be the AI uh, <laughs> mantra here, you know, hmm. let's get it out there and, you know, regulations are going to catch up. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Anyway, interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah I, I expect those guys to make a deal on the stairs. Like there's no way. Yep. This yep. Same. I do too. Yeah, I do just too. negotiating to figure out how much the rate's going to be. Right. Yeah, exactly.
And go, look, Google is a, you know, it's like riding a bike. They had to do this with the news publisher stuff. So like they'll, you know, they, I don't remember who told me this story where I read this, but there was a, the guy who ran Google news when they started get, running a foul of all these small publishers everywhere in the world mm-hmm. was like, I, I just wanted to bring AI and news to the world. I don't know what's happening. And he's like, all we do now is like strike deals with everybody. And he's like, this is not what I wanted. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, like from thinking. his perspective, he's like, I thought I was doing a good thing, but yeah. Yeah. That's what the Nazis said, Bob. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, a little extreme. I know. Yeah, I know. Go a little far in, there. <laughs> good thing. Elon wants OpenAI to change their name to closed AI. Yeah. Elon Musk is the w- real world Loki, right? The <laughs> Isn't he? He's like the the chaotic Chaos. evil yeah. nut job yeah. that just sticks the wrench into the bike spokes every once in a while. You know, it just uh, like an evil whack-a-mole comes up, you know, I, I look, Elon Musk uh, played a foundational role in creating open AI. Originally open AI was non It wasn't right? as big as he said, he did make a play to try and take the whole thing over and they pushed him out. I, if you're trying to say to me that some billionaire evil genius guy is overinflated ego and didn't do as much as he think he did. And then luck had more to do with it. I'm going to tell you exactly. Uh, oh, <laughs> exactly. Plus- right. I mean, the open AI story is hilarious. A bunch of billionaires get together to haul all that talent yeah, out of the right. Google brain. Probably on they, uh, Epstein's Island there at the yeah. time, by the way. And then they right? don't and, follow through know. with the promises. Like if they had right. actually funded open AI, then, you know, there's no way Microsoft would have gotten there in the first place. Right. The, the whole thing was that, uh, um, uh, what's his name? The CTO at Microsoft. Was able to get his uh, was able to get his hooks in there because they were out of cash. They needed help, right. and it, and his only mission was get more workloads for Azure, and it was a solution to that. Right? They would, they would kick money to him if he would do that, and so yeah. they did. And now it seems so sour grapeous. Like, please, this is have you trying to make your own company? The right? kindest thing anyone's written about this suit is that well, he's raising some good issues about the ethics of AI, but legally, yeah, nothing. This is yeah. <laughs> like stupid. Um, plus, I, someone like him raising ethical issues has got. Yeah, I mean, it's not even pot kettle black. It's, it's like, are you well, kidding me? You know the. The, the premier of China every so often shows up at the UN complaining about human rights conflicts too. And it, we laugh just as hard. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There you go. I don't think anything comes of this, but no, it's just know. noise. It's just, yeah. Yeah. And that's what he's honestly, that well, is, and, the, and the fact that is, 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 you know, uh, open AI has money now. So it's like, they will pay large price lawyers to yes. keep this going around in circles. Enjoy. The real issue here is attention, right? That Elon's, got many things to work on and this is not even vaguely important. No, <laughs> no, it is not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, this is almost so goofy. It's weird to even talk about, but uh, chat GPT on mobile can now read its responses back to you out loud. I guess, you know, Shocking. Uh, yeah. What could a capability, that, right? I mean, that, what, what could AI though? do next? No, I might always um, did that. In fact, I can talk to okay. it on my iPhone. I didn't. Yeah, I don't quite get. I don't know that. what they're saying there. I, I. It's weird to me that we've gone back to command line interfaces, kind of, um, mm-hmm. with these chat bots and whatever GPTs, whatever. Um, now, but, now, what was reading back to you in is your mother's voice? That would be something. Yeah, your, well, your dead mother's voice. Which oh, is I've got thing it, as it well. Reads right? to me I mean, in my yeah. Scarlett Johansson's voice. Nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> tell, <laughs> me, tell me about Third. Paul Thorat. Is he no, still see, alive? My voice, it's the it's the woman who does the Paris subway announcements. Oh, why? You know, like the the Louvre. The I Louvre. Find any information about Paul Thorat or his current? <laughs> it's possible that I might not have the most up to date information. Get her, you get my name out of her mouth. <laughs> Doesn't she sound like Scarlett? Way I yeah, she really does. Totally. Or a no. person you're curious about. Watching the movie, her all over again. Yeah. I mean, it's clear they knew that. Yeah. yeah. So th- I've had that for a long time. I don't know where this story oh, comes that's from. That's funny. Yeah. I, 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 like, yeah. We've already probably spent more time than this deserves, yes. but it just okay, happened. Fine. I don't know. That. <laughs> Uh, Anthropic, like I said, announced uh, their Cloud 3 family of models, right? So, like, Google Gemini and a lot of other models, kind of a tiered thing. 
um, where you go from, uh, you can choose between speed and accuracy, <laughs> basically, right? Um, and whatever, and that's fine. Uh, Claude underpowers a lot of the G uh, AI capabilities we see elsewhere, including, like I said, uh, Leo AI on Brave, which we'll talk about again in a moment. Um, uh, Apple, so normally wouldn't talk about a, uh, I almost called it an iBook, hilarious, uh, a MacBook Air, right? So Apple released the M3 version of the MacBook Air. It's exactly mm -hmm. what it sounds like. It's an M2 MacBook Air with an M3 chip in it. It's probably 20% faster or something, right? But hardware wise, all the same components, et cetera, et cetera. But if you go and read their little uh, announcement, my God, do they talk about AI, this company that never talked about AI until like 10 seconds ago. Right. And they even put Microsoft Copilot in the announcement, which is kind of ludicrous because they were trying to remind people basically that, you know, a lot of this AI stuff you're seeing out there runs on the web and the web works great on the Mac. Um, there's nothing in the Mac that makes Copilot run better. It's a web service, right? But they are positioning for that. And to be fair to Apple, I'm not I'm joking in a way here, but Apple is at MPUs and they're Apple Silicon for the duration, right? And they have been talking about some of this stuff for a while. Um, they have their own developer show coming up in June and they're going to talk the hell out of AI. I can tell you there's no doubt about it. So Microsoft will do it at uh, Build uh, in May. Google will do it at I.O. also probably in May. And Apple will do it at WWDC. And now they're positioning their new kind of consumer laptop uh, as, you know, kind of the ultimate uh, AI PC, this term we've just started using two seconds ago. Uh, I will point out that you cannot spell air without AI. Nice. Some logo stuff. Look at you being clever. Yeah. Uh, are not clever, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> lack of cleverness. But you're right, we're going to be, May and June, we are just going to be hammered. Oh, just, yeah, hammered. slapped in the face continuously, yeah. Just so many AI fish whacking away. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, and then finally, just on the AI front, uh, I mentioned Brave Leo. Uh, they brought that to their Android version of the web browser now. So you can access Leo right on your phone, like the other 131 ways you can access AI on your phone. Um, Leo on, in Brave actually works pretty well. Like I said, I'm not a, like a big fan of sidebars, but I have been playing around with it. It's actually pretty good. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, uh, they use, uh, I think you can actually choose, but they use, um, the Anthropic models, the Claude models under the covers, I don't think they moved to three yet. That just came out. But uh, they there was an update to something called Mistral, I assume, because it's French. Mm -hmm. um, That's and, actually a really uh, good open source uh, LLM. Mistral, I guess. Mistral. And they've got Mistral. a big deal with Microsoft now. Yeah, so there's a big update to that, right? Uh, better performance and accuracy, et cetera. This is the other thing. You know, as uh, consumers, as individuals, we can look at these news stories and we can look at the features that are kind of coming to us for as people. But there's these other stories kind of happening on the back end, like the Cloud 3 stuff. And um, this that's going to inform how these things are brewed, right? And it, for this period of time, especially, I, I wouldn't normally say to someone like, hey, you should uh, pay attention to the APIs that Microsoft's adding to the Win32 there. But uh, we are in that kind of an era where this stuff is happening very quickly. And it's kind of interesting to go and look at how they describe these uh, competing models and, and how they compare to the market leaders, right? Everyone is very hot to show that what they have, whether it's Gemini or Mixtral or um, uh, Cloud or whatever it is, is better than OpenAI ChatGPT4, right? Yeah. <laughs> like this is the the bar now, like this is the comparison. So everybody compares them again. But I also looked at it from Microsoft's perspective as we're, we're right, we may will be getting some heat on the whole OpenAI relationship. So let's make sure we have some other stacks handy. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yep. And, and you also want to play in that space where developers are right now, where they want to experiment with AI, but they want to do it locally. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole, it's not a family, there's a whole competing body of SLMs, I call them, uh, that run locally. And Microsoft has invested in a bunch of that stuff and created some of their own as well. And, um, you know, and Google, uh, I think, is the only company, the big company doing this that has kind of drawn a comparison between their big bucket LLM in the sky, Gemini, and this little thing they made for local use, yeah. uh, Gemma. But uh, there's no doubt Microsoft OpenAI, et cetera. If oh, they have well, and certainly device. when I looked at Mistral, like what they've done is optimize the Mistral large to run on Azure. Yep. And that speaks to, hey, I want to do development fast and I'll run against the cloud for this. Mm -hmm. Knowing at some point I could optimize down to see, can I make this run on an edge device, maybe with a smaller Mistral implementation, or yeah. I bought big hardware to run the large locally. Like the, it's uh, we the talked about running am Android emulators before you're making an app, you run this kind of emulator. Yeah. The next step up from that would be connecting an actual device and 
side loading it on there. This um, is kind of the AI version of that, right? We can get started locally. It could be on an airplane offline. It's, you know, you can, you can work. Well, I mean, I'm doing this with the better. house with using the open AI for the voice on the house. Mm -hmm. With an eye to at some point, I'll implement it in a machine and run it locally. So I'm not dependent on the internet. How probably. would, um, how would Stacey react to your AI in the house speaking like Scarlett Johansson? I'm just curious. That's a great feature. I have not spent <laughs> enough time on that. I, need to I could, that. I, I could tell you, I think I could tell you the exact words that would come out of my wife's mouth. It would be, <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> I think that would be the end of that conversation. It seemed like a good idea when I was, but you know, I don't know if you noticed this. I travel a fair bit, but maybe I should just speak in my voice. Yeah, there you go. No, but that would confuse her. She would start having conversations, right? And then she'd be like, wait, Richard, is that, is it, is that is you, in Europe? Richard? I thought yeah. you were in Europe, Richard. At least this machine would his, uh, his, his wife does not sound like the mother from Psycho, by the way. <laughs> I know, I was um, turning it into a horror I don't, movie. I don't know what that was. was I was turning it into a horror movie. I, was, I don't know why it, it turned Richard? into like old lady Simpson there for a second. <laughs> 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 I apologize. Uh, that was not an attempted impression not, of your wife. Not, I was. I wouldn't try to impersonate her, frankly. But I. Movie. But that yeah. was not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Richard, yeah. you home? Or have you come home to me? <clears throat> I think that's fun. I like it. I think you should yeah. do that, Richard. Uh, I did it, a it, while it, back. It, remember, back in the days of every so often. standalone GPSs. Yes. Tom, Tom. Yeah, right. You get, that's right. You get your voices. Had yeah. celebrity voices. James Earl Jones did one, right? Yeah, and they even the circle let, is now complete. Like you exactly. went through the rotary. They even beautiful. Let you do your own. So I have a Tom Tom voice. That's Are you mine. Serious? That's you. That's too. Oh, I love it. So you trained it. Like you just read some. Yeah, they give you a, a script to read, and then it, it makes. I it. love it. The funniest thing I used it. I guess I had ways. Ways will still use those voices. I had ways set up, and I was yeah. navigating. I said. But that sounds kind of like me to my wife. She says, you idiot, it is I you. would rather have your voice on ways than my voice. I can't stand hearing you. my voice. I don't know why anyone listens to this show. But, <laughs> or, yeah, God, that's great. Is that uh, hysterical? You definitely yeah. opportunity to have some fun with it. Yeah. I think I love this AI stuff. And by the way, the response I have, because it's only a matter of time. You know, I just did a search on uh, a subject that Elon Musk uh, subject, Elon Musk versus open AI and perplexity. Yeah. It summarized it beautifully. I could probably read it because we'll talk about it on this week in Google. Uh, yep. I could probably read it straight on this week in Google and it would be, it'd be my yeah. job done. And it reads. Yeah. Right. It's like you wrote a script. Yeah. 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 It's quite right. well done. Even to the kind of the synopsis at the end, in summary, the private emails are real. Must really a mom. I mean, I could do this. Oh, and then what it makes me realize, and it's the same thing with you and your articles, is the yeah. the it's the facts now. And this has been that way. It's been coming it's anyway, but it's certainly been that way when the internet started and you could search. Facts have become essentially fungible. They're not. Here's they have, the thing. All right, so they I, have no value. What the I, value I is what 100%. you add, right? Here, but here's the problem. What if I train AI? on everything I've ever written. Yeah. God help me. Everything I've ever said because the, you know, podcasts yeah, are out there, yeah, whatever. Yeah. It could, it could do that too. Yes. Right? What if it could provide the analysis <laughs> Then we're based on your ball, history? Then it's over. You, <laughs> we this is retire. what you think. Oh. It would yeah. just tell me what I think. Yeah. And I would just have to nod my head and drool because at that point I've stopped thinking, yeah. you know, Paul, my voice there, uh, there are, 1,056 days, three hours, 34 minutes, and 20 seconds of my voice oh, geez, on what? the internet. How do you, wait, 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 how did you just come I up with that I have a figure? display that tells me. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, wait, 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 what are you doing? What, what, what math is this? Thanks to Paul, Patrick uh, Delahanty. Happy birthday, Patrick. It's his birthday today. Uh, I know nice. how many hours of content we've created. 28,235 episodes. <laughs> what? Now, no I'm not way. on all of them, but I'm on the bulk of them. So... There's certainly many, many hours yeah. of, uh, of content. Yep. How long That's before I mean, we though. don't like, have to my do God, the show, this thing Paul? Could, we just say... It could literally... Uh, ugh, here's like the news. Scary. Here's this week's yeah. news. Uh, yeah. Generate a show with Paul, Richard, and Leo. Uh, yeah. Make it an hour and 32 minutes, and it, we'd be done. And I bet you in oh. a few years, it'll be indistinguishable. Mm. Wow. Now what? I'd hope we have a little more original thought than that. But we'll I see. would hope so. I mean, that's what I'm saying is 
in my thinking, uh, facts have already were long time ago had, you know, they used to have a lot of value knowing something, not so much That's anymore. Right. Uh, well, then it became the New York Times literally is the, the paper of record, right? Well, it's supposed to be, right? I, okay, I'm not, I'm not sorry. I'm not debating if it's accurate. I'm just saying like, that was the tactic. <laughs> that was the theory. And yeah. I, 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 don't know, I have my issues with the New York Times, yeah. but I, but yes, uh, now facts are just facts, right? So yeah. I, actually we argue about what are facts today too, but yeah, I, in many ways, like what I've done and, you know, Richard too, right? With run as and do analysis um, on and rocks. I mean, a lot of it, right. Is you're, you're in your case, interviewing somebody and you're drawing out bits of, you know, sometimes Their people story. say things and it makes you think of something and you go down this path. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that that's the interesting conversation. Right. Yeah. And I, I being cut out of that, like I said, I'm not quite old enough, but I can, you know, I can see the light at the end of this train tunnel. I can also see there's a train coming, but it's, uh, it's scary. I don't know how else to say it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. No, I, I'll tell you as someone who's done several thousand interviews, like the best response to any of your questions is, wow, I've never been asked that before. Yes, like, yes you know, exactly. Well, I hadn't thought of that. Like that's yeah. when you know you've done something. That's right. That's right. But it doesn't right. happen that often. It's true. I always suspect they're lying when they say it, but, um, <laughs> but by yes. the way, the, the, uh, that, the one they're lying about is, wow, that's a really great question. It's like, no, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. no, there's, there's no such thing as a bad question. Really? I, I think there are mostly bad questions. Um, I think most customers are wrong. I disagree with most things. This, <laughs> this analysis that I just did was in perplexity using Claude three, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because it is available. Oh, so it just released. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you could choose which, uh, which LLM you want to use, uh, okay. in perplexity, which is one of the reasons. Uh, it does a it does a, a scary good job, and it does start to sound like opinion. So it starts to sound like analysis, which makes me think we're just yeah. a few years off. Well, it, it's I mean, in this case, it's probably sucking analysis out as part of. The uh, yeah, concept, that's true. Right, but it would suck analysis um, out of us, which could be <laughs> fun. Sure, but I'm we just, sure could suck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't. I'm not going to worry about it. I don't. You know. It yeah. is what it is. I, I want to be aware of it. I, I It's worth being aware of for sure. It's yeah. God, it's just going to improve so much so fast. That's the thing. It, it's going to be very interesting to see how this comes together. Yeah. Not so sure that it will. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's unclear. It might, it might not. Yeah. It might, no, it might be headed for another AI winner. Well, look, our tendency is to apply Moore's law to everything we look right. at and we're wrong. But Moore's law applies to very few things. Right. And, That's uh, true. And, yeah. and for the most part, when you look at the architecture of LLMs, it's like does not apply here. Right. The data set is not exponentially growing. The computer resource no. is not exponentially growing. Like it's it's not moving that quickly. Could it be optimized? Yes. Can it get better? Definitely. Is it is it uh, logarithmic? No. I actually just read an article in City Journal by Michael Totten who says it's double logarith double exponential. <laughs> Exponential. <laughs> exponential I, plus 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 <clears throat> it's an exponential of an exponential uh it's exponential squared this is actually exponential growth is radically counterintuitive he says right of course uh we we know we can't think of that our information technology not specifically ai but just information technology is currently advancing he says at a double exponential rate uh what he's basically saying is 30 years from now it's going to look a lot different. It will mm, be 30 years from now. I think he AI said will have killed all the humans. I think we'll his premise dead. is <clears throat> something like the next 10 years will be, or 30 years will be like a billion years in the past. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, mankind has only been around for what's the figure? 6,500, 200 years. to 300,000. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Not a lot of time. <clears throat> I don't, I, I don't disagree that 30 years from now, it'll be very hard to picture what things will be yeah. like. But um, I also think we're banging against the edges of an awful lot of our uh, yeah. growth. We were supposed to have flying cars by now, you know, until yeah. that happens. I, I don't know that. I well, can that's only because we steer. I mean, that's because we projected what we thought would happen, which yeah. I don't think you can. Uh, well, you know, oddly enough, that's how everything happens. Because we, we ima <laughs> yeah, right. First, right. You can right. imagine it, then you manifest it. Right. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah, it's, uh, wow, this that was, was a little too existential for this show. No, <laughs> in know, fact, this like, is uh, <laughs> all of these articles I have set up or teed up for Twig, where we just talk about stuff like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think it's very, I, uh, it's very. We're in interesting times. You wouldn't deny that. Exactly, Richard. it's yeah. the perfect phrase because it it, it highlights uh, the negative as well as the positive nicely. <laughs> you know, how would you know uh, either way? And I don't yeah. think you can really predict what's going to happen. I think it's massive paradigm shifts all the way down. So it's hard to predict because. We just don't know. Right. We didn't have time smashing time. They thought he yeah. quotes, um, he quotes, um, uh, the genome guy, uh, Actually, he's quoting Ray Kurzweil here. He says, yeah. <clears throat> halfway through the genome project, a 14-year project started in 1990. Halfway through, only 1% of the genome had been collected. Mainstream critics yeah, call it a so failure because they figured seven years, 1%, it's going to take 700 Kurzweil <laughs> yep. says, at the time, oh, we finished 1%. We're almost done because 1% is only right, right. seven doublings from 100%. He said it did indeed double every year we finished seven years later. This, this is, is the difference between a writer and a mathematician. See, this is Kurzweil because that, this, he's that initial easy. math that you read seemed uh, sound to me. Yeah. No, this <laughs> yeah. is Ray Kurzweil, who is a mathematician and yeah. a computer scientist. No, that's what I mean, AI guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. The age of the spiritual machines. He, that's yeah. the guy. Yeah. All singularity. He said the singularity is near. That was the title of another book. I We interviewed him shortly after that came out. This was 20 years ago. And uh, I said, what are they going to What's the A guy going to do when it gets as smart as us? Aren't we? Shouldn't we be afraid? He said, no. They're going to think of us as, as like their parents, their creators. Cute pets. They're going to love us. <laughs> no, they're going to love us because we made them. Sure. I mean, that's as much of a guess gonna, as anybody. And they're going to gonna pat us on the head and send us to the home. Bye-bye. Yeah. You're cute. Get yeah, it. yeah. Bye-bye. Here's a Have laser. A time. Have fun. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you all about pickleball. You're going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, oh, by God, the way, an don't. excellent sport. <laughs> I don't get me started. Please, please don't let me I go. I plan on playing a lot of pickleball in Mexico. I'm just saying. Hey, you oh, you're going to be one of those people. Do you show up with the, the white outfits and the... I already wear sandals with socks. God Watch God. out. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, Xbox. Is, when people Please. complain about gentrification. Uh, okay. So, uh, yes, Xbox. So, last week, uh, I mentioned that DirectSR had come up in a uh, a future, uh, it was a GDR, what do you call it? The Game Developer Conference GDC. Right, SR being super resolution. Super resolution, yeah. yeah. So I think Microsoft meant for this to be a little more surprised because it kind of came out, they just basically said, all right, look, we're working on this thing called Direct SR. It's a new API for, you know, a new Direct X API. We're actually working with the major GPU vendors, right? AMD, uh, which is uh, what, uh, Radeon, uh, NVIDIA and Intel, interesting. Um, they all have their own solutions either in place or in the making for this type of thing, but we're going to kind of unify it into this one thing that one API that developers can target. And um, we're going to, you know, we're going to announce it formally and describe it in better detail at the GDC, uh, which I think is later this month. So, yeah, I mean, this has been rumored for a while. There have been hints of it in Windows Insider builds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, cool. Um, we'll see. So there'll be a public. We're basically this. talking about a super upscaler, right? Like just yeah, that exactly. Yeah, everything. Every and, and and you know the funny thing is in games things are remarkably consistent. So the upscaler is going to work like a hot damn. Yeah, like the uh, you know as an older guy, and you know you go back. We just talked a couple of months ago about the anniversary of the original Half Life, and that team got mm -hmm. together and did their own kind of upscaling of the game, yeah. among other things. And I love those kind of efforts, especially for the classics. Um, and this is going to basically help automate that for other companies and other game titles, obviously. So there will be more of that. And actually, there won't really be more of that. If this works correctly, I don't think you have to do much. I think you could just install the old game and get upscaling. Like Get upscaled. It makes me think, you know what I really want to upscale? Like Zork. Yeah. Upscale Zork. Oh, yeah. Um, with clear make type it, funds. Take an original um, text adventure, mix in a little Sora and make it into a play as you oh go. Oh my movie. God, what a great uh, idea. It's only a matter of time. Um, I mean, obviously, one of the, the, the next steps beyond Zork, I'm trying to come up with the name of one of these things. They were text adventures that just had still graphics, right? Yeah. And yeah, then, yes, of course, you like had Mist. like the, the, 
Okay. Uh, well, but but this was a playable world. I guess it was. You, you could kind of move around, right? I mean, yeah, it was um, still, there were games like was some uh, minor animation, but it was really still. Yeah, it was done then, in you know, guard uh, for Christ's sake. Okay. Yeah. King's Quest, right? Where you King's have Quest, uh, it's still yeah. background, but you move the characters around and you type in little yeah, things. Or so the yeah. uh, uh, the Lucas Arts games. Remember uh, a Dragon Slayer in the in the arcade. In the arcade. Version. That was so exciting. Yeah, that was, was flipping like, right, flipping wow. screens, right? Yeah. Yeah, the the Lucasfilm game I think of is Age of the Tentacle. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Great. Yep. yep, yep. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess what I'm talking about is like back in the day, like Quake would come out and Quake was great, but it was also bit more graphics. And then they came up with like Quake GL, you know, and to get smooth graphics with Quake GL, you had to buy a very specific graphic card, which for two seconds was the biggest thing in the world. And, uh, you know, eventually we get hardware accelerated graphics that are just kind of built into systems and things improve, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I would say anything made since, well, actually this could apply to older games too. Yeah. Honestly, it could apply to older games, any graphical games. I mean, it's, it's neat. Like it's neat that we don't have to jump through hoops to make this happen or hope that the original developer, whoever owns that game now will care enough to, you know, want to do some anniversary edition, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, this could be great. And for uh, Xbox in particular, the, as a platform, I mean, a big part of their story, their story is the backward compatibility stuff and their um, kind of love of your library in the past and and whatever. And we have OG Xbox games or 360 games. Yep. I'd like to see a uh, an auto scaled version of like Call of Duty 2, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that would be a fun game to play. <clears throat> uh, I tell you, you know, as, as these Gen AI r- tools come into play i think yeah. you're also going to see remixes of games they're going to change up the graphics using those tools they may yeah. even try, try and play with the storyline playing with outcomes you know like it just it's not that much of a stretch that's true the game, the, then the original game becomes a template for an engine to create visualizations for you i wonder how much ai went into the remix of final fantasy 7 which is the hot game right now i know you guys oh. don't do that stuff but um, it was much upscaled. I bet you a yeah, lot of it with AI. In fact, if you look at it, it kind of right. has that AI feel to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, Is that Scarlett Johansson? Yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, soon um, everyone will what look has like AI Scar done? Joe and sound like Scar Joe. This is the real problem when we start getting out of <laughs> classes. He's like, everybody sounds like Scarlett Johansson to me now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Replace all, them all. a little bit of vocal fry. Yeah. yeah. A little bit yeah. of up up talk. Mm-hmm. <sighs> <sighs> we uh, we almost lost okay. one of our producers when Final yeah. Fantasy VII came out. He uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, that happens. Yeah, he they got to go play it out. <laughs> yes, let's. Do this. Those games end like, but it might be a while. It might be a while. Yeah, that does bring us to the segment you're all looking for. Yeah, Uh, sorry. (laughs) I've lost some thought there. Uh, So last month, Microsoft had an Xbox partner event called Developer Direct. They announced some games that were not Activision Blizzard games. Uh, Today, or right before the show, they did something similar. Um, uh, The uh, Xbox partner preview. Again, just a bunch of games that are not uh, Activision Blizzard. And seriously, what is happening? Um, I I hear a theme. There's a theme here somewhere. I know. We're just in this weird holding pattern with this stuff. But again, I I think what they're trying to do is show the health of the ecosystem. You know, it's not just Activision. You got to give me a year, man. It takes a while. Oh, it's killing me. Um, So, yeah, this is a, a, I don't know, stock or original trilogy. I don't know. Most of these games don't mean anything to me, but there were a bunch of third party games announced today that I just don't care about because they're not (laughs) Activision Blizzard. And seriously, stop. (laughs) <laughs> or start or something, do something with it. I don't know. They just not this. That's all. Just, thank you. Exactly. Uh, we also got a, another wave of games for the first half of March for Xbox Game Pass. Kind of a short list, just like six games, you know, six or seven games. Uh, the big one is MLB The Show 24. So the baseball season is coming up. Uh, that should be pretty big. Well, and then totally current, them, yeah. I don't know. More hammer. Well, I always 000. think about these things as older games, but no, that's a current generation game. So. Yep. Yeah. Brand new. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Okay. Um, and then in uh, news of the esoteria, <laughs> um, stack counter, which is the only thing we have these days, uh, revealed that as of this past month, Linux for the first time surpassed 4% usage share. Um, there was a, uh, another yeah. publication. Oh, sorry. It took Linux 30 years <laughs> to get to 3%. 
<laughs> and it took them eight months to get the four percent. I'm telling eight. you, double exponential, baby. So I don't think it's because of Leo's constant <laughs> prophesizing of this platform. The many times he has bought a ThinkPad or a similar laptop, wiped out Windows and put oh, ThinkPad. Oh, God, or, uh, it feels it so good center. when you do that, too. I, <laughs> it's like <sighs> rip it a scab. Um, Actually had I, Linux I on this uh, Lenovo ThinkPad Extreme, and it really hurt me to put Windows back on it, but I had to. <laughs> for you. I did it for you. Um, well, uh, I, I don't want any part of the blame on that one, but uh, <laughs> I'm wondering if it is in Steam Deck. Uh, yeah, right? uh, it is definitely, yeah. You know, when you think about Phenomenal Linux right. uh, as a desktop platform, not as a server or whatever, but as a desktop PC platform, right? I mean, who uses this thing, right? Developers, obviously, right? Some enthusiasts, but that's got to be a small audience. There's probably some scientific engineering stuff where it makes sense to have Linux on the client because you're hitting Linux on servers, a server. Servers, obviously, the big That kind of thing. No, but I mean, just yeah. on the desktop, right? But actually, there is a, a growing kind of a game story there, gamer story. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Steam Deck's not all of it, but... Three or four million now, so... Yeah, I mean, that's... You know, not nothing. So, uh, you know, what does it take? I don't know. I mean, talk to me when you get to 5%. I don't know what we're talking about. I guess we'll see. Well, if you throw mobile device, if you throw those devices in with PCs, yeah. 250 million PCs, like 3 million Steam decks is a percentage point. Yeah. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, the only problem for Linux, let me see if I can find this uh, in my write up, is uh, obviously Windows is number one, right? Mac is number two. Number three is something called Other. Now, I've not used Other. <laughs> it's um, really good. Everybody should try it. It's a 50% no, no. more usage than Linux. Actually, 100% more uh, usage. Uh, wow. It's oh, must 6 be Chrome OS. Versus. Is Chrome OS oh, that's on the list? Similar. Yeah, no, Chrome OS is in there too, but I think they are... Bah, 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 bah. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, 2.26. So actually, Linux is uh, more than Chrome OS. There you go. Huh. Right? Linux, Imagine Chrome being, OS is Linux, but that's okay. We well, yeah, but it doesn't it's a special identify Linux. as... Yeah. It, you yeah. say Linux, what do you mean? Right. Right. I mean, you can you could have a Linux environment. You could run Linux apps on Chrome. That's kind of cool, right? Uh, I mean, we can do it on Windows, sort of, right, with uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux, but it's not a, it's not enabled by default, et cetera. And it's interesting. I don't... You know, I don't want to say, I mean, uh, Bill Gates and Microsoft, those guys were really worried about Linux about exactly 20 years ago, actually. And uh, and exactly probably 30 years ago, too, to be uh, honest, but uh, or 25 years ago anyway. But uh, obviously, as a desktop platform, it hasn't materialized, but um, it, it certainly answered some problems on the server that uh, Microsoft probably regrets for sure. Yeah, yeah I don't know. That's true. I mean, the Azure guys couldn't care less. It's become very normal for for modern, modern C sharp developers to deploy to Linux servers. Oh, uh, right. I, right. Like a, I mean, I guess what I mean is, right. <laughs> from the perspective of Windows Server on prem at the time, they probably thought they were sitting pretty. And if they could have seen the future where Linux is such a major component of Azure usage, they probably would be throwing up in their mouths right now. Yeah, except yeah. they all own stock and they like the price. <laughs> okay. You know, yeah. like well, that's sort of the reality of it. They've all made a lot of money. Because yeah. no, I mean, I mean, at the time, I, I, yes, no, I understand. It's, it's all, we all, we all do the Kumbaya thing now. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, 2003, 2005, they were supposed to compete. Linux yeah. was still a cancer, uh, you know, yeah. Those are the battle days. That's it. Yeah. You know, and he was really complaining, you know, Palmer was complaining about GPL. GPL. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, well, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, what used to be called star office soon. I mean, you know, we the, the world used to be such that uh, Sun Microsystem, this is, is probably apocryphal, but mm -hmm. went to look at like, what would it cost to license Microsoft Office for all 12,000 of our employees? I see. How much would it cost to buy this uh, Office Suite and just use that? Let's do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. They bought an Office Suite, right? I mean, uh, the list of companies that tried to compete head to head with Microsoft is yeah. long. Uh, yeah. It might have ended with uh, Sun, which got sucked up by Oracle back in, I don't know, year 2010. Shattered like remnants were consumed by, yes. Yeah, kind of a sad end uh, to a, a proud company, unfortunately. Anyway, there you go. That has nothing to do with Xbox. I have no idea why I went off on that tangent, but yeah. there you go. Okay. I guess it's back of the book. What? No, can't be. How did it happen? It's only one twenty-one in the afternoon. So weird. Weird. All right, we'll take a little time out. Actually, I'm going to use this uh, moment in time. Mm -hmm. 
Not to play yeah. some Final Fantasy VII reboots, <laughs> but to tell you about our club. We're having a wonderful conversation in the club about Linux and Windows and Mac and so forth. And I have to say, the club is a great place for geeks who like to kind of hang out and talk about geeky stuff. Uh, that's our Club Twit Discord, but that's just a part of the club. The club also includes ad-free versions of all of our shows and tracker-free. Now, you may say, well, gosh, do you do trackers? We have some limited trackers. We need to count audience numbers. That's how we charge advertisers. Um, some advertisers want to know how effective their campaigns are, so we use a, a technology that does that without revealing anything about you to anybody. Uh, and when we have direct ad insertion, as we do on this show, uh, all of the uh, shows are stored on their servers. We use AdvertiseCast, which is with Libsyn, and they have access to your IP address and whatever information that gives them. But if you listen, if you're a member of the club and you listen to the ad-free versions of shows, none of that's there because we don't need it. Advertisers want more and more. In fact, we had, we had to actually literally turn an agency down and lose a couple of advertisers from that agency because they wanted us to add more tracking. And we said, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And not only because I won't, I don't want to, but because we know you don't want it. And people run ad blockers and stuff that just stops that stuff cold. So we said no to them. They pulled a bunch of advertising. I think in the long run, advertising is, is, is not the best way to support our shows. That's why we come to you for the club. $7 a month. It's not much. You get ad-free versions of everything. You get video as well as audio versions of all of our shows. You get video from before and after the shows. Uh, we're trying to give you some benefits. The real benefit, though, is knowing that you're helping us continue to do what we take very seriously, our mission, which we take very seriously, which is to keep you informed on what's happening in the world of tech so that you can use it in your life. Or defend yourself against it, as the case may be. If you like, if you listen to more than, all I ask, if you listen to more than one show a week, maybe two or three shows a week, join the club. Help us out. Twit.tv slash club. Twit, you can pay more if you wish. You don't have to. Seven bucks a month. It's like a couple of cups of coffee. We want to make it affordable. Uh, but it really does make a difference. Twit.tv slash club. Twit. And I thank you in advance for uh, for your support. We want to keep doing what we're doing. Um, and now we're going to pause for an insertion. <laughs> Jeez. That Yikes. sounds bad, doesn't it? <laughs> it's not going to hurt. It won't hurt. Everything, not one minute. going to be fine. <laughs> Close your eyes and think of England. <laughs> I, hope you, I hope you enjoyed the insertion. We now nice. continue with Mac Break, Mac Break Weekly. Let me say that again. We now yeah, continue with enough. Windows Weekly. And Paul Theratz, uh back of the book, his tip of the week. By the I'm way, them Cubs. Paul, um, I love the painting behind you. Thank you for that. Oh yeah, it's uh yeah, it only took two years. Um, we're getting there. So I know, think you got so. tired of all of the uh, edits that were showing up in the Club Twit Discord of <laughs> stuff behind yeah. you. <laughs> it was actually no, I, that's funny. not why, but we you know I, we Most finally like, found a guy. We paint. You got yeah. some, yeah, we got. So now we we've, we've been buying stuff to hang up. We just That's a good, it's a nice. Is that a local thing. artist uh, or, or? Yeah, it is, and like it's it. it's actually signed in the back as well. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's nice. yeah. kind of a bunch of uh, Mexico City landmarks. Yeah. yeah, you should have that. You should support yeah. support, support the local arts. Yeah, we go to this bunch of art fair stuff here every weekend, and <sighs> I'm so jealous. Other times. So jealous. Nice. <sighs> All, All right. right. So th this has nothing to do with Windows, but. I felt compelled to, to write this up and mention it today. If you use Twitter, you got to look at this right away. It's important. Um, they enabled a feature that allows anyone to call you audio or video if you're on Twitter <laughs> and uh, turn that off. Oh, my God. <laughs> is my advice. Yeah, that's a nightmare. Yeah, it's nuts. It is a weird privacy invasion. Uh, it's only on the Elon, mobile app. Uh, and I really yeah. want to tell you, you guys just don't understand. <laughs> it's you enabled by default, like I said, for everybody. The app doesn't wow. tell you that this happened. It just happened. Um, you, have you gotten calls? Uh, no, I turned it off immediately. Yeah. Um, it's so the, the deal. And also uh, anyone who calls, you can find out your IP address so they can learn basically where you oh are. Oh, my God. That's um, there's, there's some yeah, some huge problems here. So uh, the Twitter user interface is Byzantine, to say the least. But uh, it'd be easier reading this. But basically go into your profile settings and support. Settings and privacy, settings and or privacy and safety, direct messages. 
you'll see enable audio and video calling is enabled. My advice, turn that thing off. But wow. if you want to leave it on for some reason, at least change the permission level to uh, from everyone, <laughs> which is unbelievable, to people you follow or people in your address book or whatever you feel comfortable with. Right. Um, there's also a switch for enhanced call privacy that will turn off the ability of these people to see your IP address, which inexplicably is on by default, which is crazy. Is this in um, privacy anyway. and safety? You said. Yeah, I just. I'm sorry. I just. I know. Uh, I, I know. I'm sorry. I I just, no, no, no. It's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you know, profile picture, uh, privacy, uh, settings and privacy. I'm sorry. Settings and support. <laughs> yeah. Settings and privacy. Yeah. Privacy and safety. Yeah. And then there'll be a direct messages. Okay. Uh, oh, change this. Because that's yep. not just direct messages. That's phone no, calls. No, this is phone call. These are calls, audio and video calls. Yep. Oh, Crazy. my God. Unfortunately, it's no one on mine. I must have I must have good. preemptively oh, okay, done good. that way back when okay. in the day. I guess Terrible. this is a feature that people who paid for Twitter already had, and they right. just flipped the switch for everybody. Hey, for now reason. you all can uh, be bugged by Elon personally. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for right-wing conspiracy theories, but you want them in audio format, you know, Would leave it on. That, that. Yeah. <laughs> that will, uh, that yeah. will help. Uh, yeah. that will, yeah, bring them right to your ear. Wow. That'd be nice. Wow. Yeah. Um, this is not really a tip per se, but, you know, by my book, it's over 1,100 pages long. I'm updating it for moment five. I've kind of outlined the order of things. You can read about that if you want. Um, some, I think, maybe end of the year last year, I think it was, I switched from Word uh, because I couldn't stand the constant interruptions, these stupid little message banner things that they will, will not let you turn off. And in particular, if you're not using uh, OneDrive for storing your documents by default, et cetera, et cetera. So I returned to kind of an old favorite of mine, which is Typora, which is a terrific uh, markdown Typora. editor. Yeah. I love it too. Yeah. But, you know, I've heard from a bunch of people who are like, yeah, I get it that you're using this thing. It's kind of esoteric. It's not really what I'm looking for. So, um, during this trip, probably the second half of this trip, I started looking at different office, mostly word. I'm mostly a writer, so I look at the word stuff, but kind of um, alternatives and kind of a classic one. This is the LibreOffice Writer, which is the word processing component of LibreOffice, the free office suite. It's actually pretty terrific, and wow. it's a yeah, it's a it's a blast from the past in many ways totally. because like Word back in the day or Office, you know, and by back in the day, I literally mean twenty years ago. You could, as a power user, go in and customize every little toolbar, remove and add buttons and arrange them exactly the way you want, save that configuration. And then when you reinstalled Word or Office or whatever on a different computer, you could bring it all back and have your custom configuration returned. You can still do that in Office today. I suspect very few people do that, right? But this is a feature of LibreOffice. And so I, I kind of stripped it down and did what, you know, made all my settings changes and then kind of ensured that they worked across computers because you can save, it's actually a folder in this case, but you just copy a folder over and every little change you've made, every little autocorrect change, every little whatever, um, the text rendering performance, the compatibility is fantastic. I have a, a very hard line uh, requirement that when I paste into WordPress, which is where most of my stuff goes, it has to go without any additional codes or, you know, formatting issues. LibreOffice is perfect. It's just as good as Word. So 100% free. doesn't bug you about where you want to save your files. I'm not saying, wow. you know, well, I am saying. I said, I'm saying you should take a look at it. It's, um, it's and then just real that quick. That Word has pestered you to the point where you have to use something else. That's yes. Sad. I I just been smacked in the face too many times. I, I just can't stand it. And this app works great, actually. I'm Frankly, I'm kind of shocked. I shouldn't be. I, I think there are only focuses on word processing. Yeah. What a thought. I know. What a crazy idea. You know what um, I like, Paul, is that you put the history of LibreOffice in here. Yeah. And, well, those links, know. those are all articles I wrote like 20 ah, years ago. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the stuff I was talking about earlier. I looked right. this up. Yeah. My articles about this are still out there. Yeah. You can find an article I wrote in 1999 about Sun Microsystems buying Star, whatever they were called, and right. crazy. And I used to, I used to uh, interview those guys. So I used to be in briefings with those guys. Like every time a new star office come out. Uh, I would have a, they would brief me on it. And Who would have it was thought? a thing. 22 years later. We're still talking about this. I know. <laughs> and it's it now makes open no source. Sense. It became open office and now it's forked into yeah. Libra office, which I think is quite good. Uh, yep. I agree with you. Yeah. Cause Oracle bought sun and right. did not seem particularly interested in keeping up to date with open office. Exactly. And so uh, the group, the, the main group of developers split off into Libra office well into a, uh, a document, um, like an organization to work on ODF and, you know, all the open document stuff. And uh, 
I don't know. I feel like when it comes to something like this, like this app or apps like this, that there are only two reactions. One is from people like, duh, Paul, it's been good for 20 years. You're stupid. <laughs> or really, it's like this thing, this is the thing. And it's like, it's not just a thing. It's actually, it's, it's very good. Uh, it's I, surprising. For a long time, people would call the radio show and say, oh, I, uh, you know, my office is from 2011 or whatever. I would frequently yeah. recommend open office and then later Libre office because it's yeah. free. And it yep. works on Windows. Yep. It works on Mac. So obviously, works on Linux. He, you know, it's good. I, I, mean, I could be wrong. This is my, my opinion, but I I suspect for a lot of people who are in the Microsoft 365 space, not companies necessarily, but maybe some companies, but people, it, it's the storage, right? You're you're paying 100 bucks a year for storage yeah, yeah. for six people. Yep. Terabyte of storage, right? And then you, you get Office, right? You get full Office. You get it on the phones. You get it on your tablets. You get it everywhere. But it's like, you know, you you come for the storage and you, and because it's there, you're like, yeah, of course I'm going to use this thing. And I would have happily used Word for the rest of my life. I actually really like Microsoft Word. I, there is no way, and I mean no even like hacker kind of way to turn this crap off. And it makes me crazy. Um, so I kind of like the fact that this thing hasn't hounded me once. And it the, that it works great is kind of, you know. Kind of a kind of the, flashback to the way software used to be. It's not in very the business much so. of yeah. Trying to tell you something else. I don't want to go down this path too deeply, but something that played a role in this is I'm reading Steven Snofsky's book. Mm. And I'm, I think I mentioned this, but I'm reading it in backwards order. So huh. the first section I read was the Windows 8 era. That's the second funny. one was Windows 7. So the, then I, but he ran Office for several years. Yeah. And so over the course of this trip, I've been reading the history of this stuff in reverse order. And it is in reading about the office team's approach to the product and how they were meeting customer needs and yada, 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 where I was reminded of how that is not what they do today. And I think it would be fascinating in some ways to talk to him about that if he could. He might have constraints on what he can say about what they're doing today. But I, I can assure you that whatever we think of this man, because I certainly have my opinions, there was a much more credible approach to uh, serving the customer need in that era. Uh, for all the Microsoft baloney, you know, they did terrible things. I get it. But uh, then we see today. And when I look at this app, I think this is what it used. This is what software used to be like. Yeah. You know? yep. They would love Linux. <laughs> <laughs> Leo, I'm going to say to you what I say to everyone when this comes up. Uh, baby steps. You know, so let's, you know. Everything you just I look, said, I, you could I say for, about I know, Linux. I know, I know, I know. I don't like when people use my own words against me. <laughs> I, I, I I first experimented with Linux uh, when I was in Scottsdale, Arizona, working in a computer lab. So this would have been 96, 7, oh, somewhere early. in there. Yeah. On floppy. Right. And you would download it because they had a yeah. high speed for the day connection. I would download these images and you would write them. So I'd sit there with a stack of floppies and feed them in one by one to oh the computer. My God. And then later I would go home and install them one by one. And it was, a, remember Slack was, it was all text-based, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, I always, I, I didn't write this in my article, but I always thought, you know, what happens when there is an, uh, an operating system like Linux and a desktop or rather an office productivity suite like Office that is completely free and does that, 10 to 20 percent that you everyone needs and the problem is the the 10 to 20 percent thing is different for everybody and that's maybe part of why it never took off but uh obviously this stuff has been in place for a long time it's i don't know i can't explain it but yeah you never know four percent just saying you know it's a uh, it's a big change in eight months and then just real quick, uh, these aren't super as important, but Vilvaldi, uh, new release. Um, Vilvaldi's claim to fame is super customizations, crazy, but they have a lot of their, not counting extensions as we know them from Chrome, but rather their additional functionality. They typically implement as what they call web panels, which are these things that come up from the sidebar. So they have native features to the browser that are just called panels, but then they have web panels and you can add any websites or apps you want to there. And I guess uh, until this most recent release, they didn't actually support extensions. And so now those web panels support extensions, right? So obviously people have things that they use to make the web better for them and they will work in the panels now. So that's something to look at if you want to spend, I don't know, let next 17 years of your life uh, customizing a browser, Vilvaldi is your option. Um, and Leo, I don't, I think I sent this to you finally, but you I did, remember yeah. a couple, Thank you. a couple of weeks ago, I could not remember the name of this, but any text is a solution is any, I think it's any text.io. Any, sorry, any type, I must type that, any type, not any text, 
And it's basically Notion, but it can run completely offline and against your own storage. If you want, you can pay them for storage, I guess, and they give you a gigabyte, but it's free uh, for now. And, and who knows? We'll see where it goes. It's a gorgeous app. I have no idea how this thing works. It is freaking me out. I used it to import my three or four biggest uh, Notion. Oh, you can import Notion? There is. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's a very complicated process. You can import from a lot of things. Um, and I can see it there, but I don't, it, it doesn't follow exactly, even though it looks like almost identically to Notion, it doesn't exactly follow the same paradigm. It's, it's almost like this object oriented language is getting in the way a little bit, you know, like they, they have very uh, strict rules about, uh, how things are organized, et cetera, et cetera. But I think for technical people, a little bit like, um, arc browser. This is one of those things for certain people that are going to look at this and go, yes, this is what I wanted. And one of the few things I don't like about Notion is that it's technically possible, but literally impossible uh, to use it offline. So you'll get on a plane. You don't have access to the internet. Yeah. You open Notion and you can't do anything. <laughs> you know, And that makes it, that's one of a, two or three things where I'm like, I just can't use it for everything. Um, I still work with documents in the file system, like an old guy and all that kind of stuff. And part of it is because I can't rely on this thing being offline and any type, not any text, I'm sorry. Any type is basically notion, but offline and for whatever it's worth, there's something called obsidian, which people have probably heard of as well. That would be another one to look at. That one works offline. I don't know as much about it. And I think I just demonstrated, I know very little about this one as well, but, uh, but for people who are, you know, maybe seeking a little bit. How much uh, is, is this? Uh, it's free right now. It's completely it's open source and free. Wow. That could change, but it, right now it's free. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. I will try this. Right it's now. very interesting it, it, in use. It is very difficult. It looks like you, you look at this, you think, Oh yeah, no, I get this thing. No, you don't, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I, you don't, I, I mean, I mean it like you'll have, you'll struggle with it, but because it's just a different, no, I, the, one of the problems with notion is that it's this hierarchical, view of all your content in the side. It's like the tree view from Windows Explorer back a million years ago. And you you go in and you go in and you go in and it, it, it makes it a little hard to use. And I this thing doesn't do that, but it's hard for other reasons. I don't know. I'm, I'm downloading it right now. I, you know, what Take I'm, a look. I'm curious I'm, what you think. But, you know, I would like, I put all our travel stuff in Notion. And yeah. that's a problem. I mean, it's nice because I have it on my phone. Yeah. I have it on my It desktop. is a problem because you'll be offline. But if I'm offline, it's not very right. useful. So one thing you should know is that there's no sense of an account, right? You type in a name. It gives you a pass key phrase, which is oh, okay. several words. Okay. You save it to some secure OneDrive, something, something, whatever. And if you use that name or whatever word you used, words, in combination with that thing, you, that you, you'll sync, <laughs> you know? And that's, it's sort of the way oh, Brave no. Sync works. Yeah, that's it's, how Brave works. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, it's yeah. very, for me, that part of it was very familiar. I'm like, nice. Yeah. I like it. It's a pass phrase. I can deal with this. Yeah. It's, it, it's once you get in and actually start using the thing where I'm like, Ugh, it, <laughs> it's a little, yeah, it's a little tough. I'm curious what you think about it. You, you know, I moved to log it. seek for most of that stuff and that's like obsidian, except it's open source and you have okay. markup files locally. You can sync. They have us, yes, you know, you I give them five. Yeah. Like in other words, it's like a view of a folder. I, yeah, it's to me, that's, yeah. there you go. Cause that's something you could sync. Because you use, if you, well, not you, I you mean, if one on uses GitHub, OneDrive you or you one use Google, or right, Dropbox, just sync, whatever you, want, yeah. whatever you want to use. Uh, to me, I like that. And any type does do that. Like you can configure it that way. And I haven't done it yet because I'm just trying to figure the app out. But again, I think a lot of technical people listen to this. I think there are, there's going to be some percentage of you who are like, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. I'm and there's going to be a lot of you who are like, right I don't know now. what the hell this thing is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm opening it right now. The everything app. Okay. Yep. The everything app. The every, you yeah. know, I think didn't Elon want to be the everything app? I mm. guess he didn't trademark it. The right. everything, everything. Everything, everything. Uh, any, that was any type at uh, any, any type. type not dot, any text. Yes. <laughs> any type dot yes. IO, you said? Yes. Um, and uh, I will get back to you. On yeah. That. Let me know. Uh, Curious. Curious. You know, the first time I really pounded on Linux, it was to get a replay TV working in Canada. Oh, boy. <laughs> they were like the Tito competitor. Yeah. Yep. And they were was, great. So you could actually get it. You yeah. could like tell that into it or something. Put, and, by the way, put out of business because yeah. they had commercial skip. And, yeah. the, and the and the, and the advertisers and the networks and the local TV channels sued them out of existence. 
Yeah. That was it. How did you get oh, into it? What was the interface? Uh, we we would DNS intercept the calls by the replay TV <laughs> to your own server. Yep. So I had an emulator of the replay TV yeah. server that I could then load with Canadian guide data. Nice. And that would, the replay TV thought it was talking to the headquarters, but it was, it was talking to my local Linux machine and it would load the guide data. So I, uh, my yep. mother had a web TV briefly and I'm telling you, she could not do what you just described. <laughs> it, was not, it was not a thing. It was, uh, it was hard work to make that and keep it running, but it was very popular while it worked because there's just right. that automation to, okay, these are the shows I want to record this week. You don't think about it again. It just works. Oh boy. That's amazing. Yeah. It was the thing back in the day. Wow. Well, Richard, yeah. it is your turn. Oh, let's talk about run as. Mm -hmm. So a uh, show I recorded at NDC in London a few weeks back. I did a show live there, but picked up a few uh, interviews this was with Scott Helm was a great security guy out of the UK. A lot of fun. And we talked about TLS, not the sexiest subject in the world. <laughs> it just you know, that little lock icon on people's browsers. But this was really from the sysadmin's perspective because TLS has gone through many iterations. And uh, if you're old enough, if you've been doing this long enough, you'll remember that before TLS, it was SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. But in both the cases of SSL 2 and 3, there was eventually an in the wild breach for it. And it was a panic to get your servers upgraded to the later version. And so eventually we switched over to TLS and even TLS now has gone through several versions, 1, 1 1.2, and now 1.3. And the older versions have lighter weight encryption, which has the possibility of being breached, even if it, then there's no record that it actually has. And so there's been a big push on switching to TLS 1.3 uh, because it's it's not deprecated. It's the latest version. The, the move's pretty simple. Like It's not a big deal to actually get that switch. You just have to pay attention for an hour or so <laughs> to go through the process to get it done. Uh, the hook, of course, was that actually TLS3 is really efficient. It works well with HTTP2. And so in many cases, encrypted sites actually run faster just by switching to 1.3. So it's, uh, it's well worth making the move. And that ended up being the whole conversation. It was just like, look, you want to stay ahead of this. Take a look or do an inventory. Take a look around. You'll find you've got a few old sites that were on older defaults. And for a little bit of your time, you can switch them up. You'll get a little performance boost. And the chances of you being exploited in between are low. So, you know, le less problems. Um, it was uh, it was a geeky conversation and toys about it, but it was one that's just like, oh yeah, you know, on that long list of inexpensive things I can do to improve security, this is one. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Now you're not going to do a dark brown liquor. Well, <laughs> the one I picked out is actually pretty dark. Oh, okay, but, yeah. okay. Uh, pretty, 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 pretty I mean, I've been a couple, <laughs> a couple of a couple of weeks in Mexico. You start, you know, you are starting to drink the good stuff too here. And, oh yeah. And, but it, I'm also reminded because remember I've talked a little bit about cognac and so forth. Like it's very funny to realize that the, all these alcohols are just not that different, right? Right. You take some product, some food stuff that produces sugars. You use those sugars to convert them to be converted into alcohol with some kind of yeast, uh, some kind of bacteria that will make it into alcohol. You then distill that. Ah, that's the, that's the bifurcation though, because yeah. there are stuff that is not distilled like beers. Pulque mm. in Mexico is incredible precursor to tequila and mezcal. Yeah. But then yeah, but they, no, then I, they concentrate the alcohols in, with distillation. You can make any alcohol out of almost anything. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, Bruno, good. It is a, it's a crazy thing. Yeah. Called a bathtub gin. But then you all, yeah. all have this tendency as you're Im improving your product to age in oak. Right. Now, all of these alcohols start out clear pretty much across the board. And then you stick them in, in wood and it adds flavors that we like. Yeah. Strangely. And so when you really dig in tequila, I mean, we do call this the brown liquor segment, you know, then this liquor does become brown because of wood. No yeah, other right. reason. Really interesting. I mean, there might be a little yeah. caramel color, but right. it's just wood. So is the, um, the only difference really the source of the sugar? The source of the sugar, there's a few little things and uh, how, on how you get there. Plus, as I've, you know, as I am prone to overreading on all of things, all of these things, and I mean, I'm in Jalisco right now, right? But Puerto Varda is in Jalisco, which is one of the tequila growing regions. And in fact, the town of Tequila is four hours drive from me. Oh, wow. 
Right. To me, it didn't seem like so much, but I'm married and I'd like to stay. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, but, but I proposed that I wanted to do a day of research. He goes with a four hour drive. Overnight. Overnight. You can't, uh, you can't drive. It's a day drive right, drive right there. there. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, not, it's more than a day. <laughs> you gotta, oh, admittedly, you my research has largely been through a large array of bottles and plenty of reading. Um, the, the, the more common name for an agave derived spirit is mezcal. Uh, all tequilas are mezcals, but not all mezcals are tequila. There That's are sure. those. There are uh, versions of mezcals that have things out of, in them other than distillate of agave. But me- tequila, by definition, is a class of mezcal made from blue agave that's grown in five regions of Mexico. Jalisco being one of them. Mexico is uh, Narit, which is right beside Jalisco, uh, Guano, uh, uh, Guanajuato, and parts of Tamaulipas. So there's all this south, this western side. Uh, they it's an area that is relatively um, dry. It definitely is tropical, so it has a wet, dry season. Uh, most growing is done at altitude. The altitude matters. The agave plant uh, prefers. It's a big succulent plant. It is not related to the pineapple at all. Uh, any <laughs> any other plant is yeah. uh, more closely related to amaryllis and, and lilies. But yeah, it's a big it's a big succulent. succulent. It prefers high altitude. It takes a long time to grow and relatively expensive to grow. In traditional means, these were largely wildly grown and freely planted and then harvested. Today, they are very carefully crafted. Uh, they are grown like most modern agriculture um, with nursery seedlings. So although because it's a uh, this this yucca plant, they actually do bulb splitting. So they, they will take a very productive uh, set of uh, a bulb and then they will split it and mature it that way. So it can be, it basically stays in the seedlings thing for almost 18 months before it's put into the ground uh, mm-hmm. and then carefully tended and grown. They have a number of blights that, that risk them. Uh, it typically takes five years to mature an agave plant, sometimes as much as 10, depends on the region. Uh, the lower down valley regions tend to build stronger flavors where the higher have lighter uh, tastes, so it depends on where they're from. And uh, of the whole plant, you cut it all the way to just the central bulb called the pina, which is the only part that's actually used to make tequila. They, it's, of course, filled with carbohydrates, complex, uh, complex sugars, so they need to be broken down. Uh, traditionally, this is done by baking the pinas. So you, you put them in an oven. And in fact, if you've ever t- tasted a smoky mezcal, much like a smoky or peaty whiskey, it's what they dry it with that puts the smoke into it. So if they dry it over wood smoke, you will get that smoky flavor. And so smoky mezcals only come that way. Tequila normally does not smoke. And it doesn't have to have smoke in it as many ways to go about drying it. Uh, and that even is a sort of a traditional method to bake them first to break the sugars down. And then they would crush them. Uh, and for a few hundred years, they've been crushed primarily mechanically using a thing called a tahona, which is a, a, a long pole. Uh, well, it's a, it's a big shallow uh, a bowl on the ground that has a post in the middle of it with a long pole sticking out of it. And it has a big stone wheel attached to it. And it, typically animals or sometimes a tractor will drive around in a circle, turning this wheel, smashing the penis. Um, that has some cleanliness issues. Like it's it's tricky to do that well, but uh, that's how that's a traditional method. Um, You could do this with a mill, but over crushing the penis brings out quite a bit of flavors. And so the modern technique now, um, they shred the penis and then put them through what's called an extraction diffuser, where it's mixed with warm water and a series of stages that gradually extracts as much sugar from them as possible. And then they'll further cook that uh, liquid, which still has long chain sugars in it, in um, a hydrolyzer, basically a big boiler to break the sugars down into glucose and fructose, the stuff that yeast can ferment successfully. Traditional tequila is lambic fermented. That is to say, they don't directly introduce yeast to it at all. It's left in open containers and the ambient yeast in the airs are what inoculate it. Uh, this can take a, up to a week or 10 days to produce what is known as musto, very much like a wart. Uh, it also has risks of being contaminated with things that aren't good. So that's tricky too. And in modern methods, they will use either a, a, a protein called inoculum, which actually accelerates fermentation, uh, or straight up beer, brewer's reese the same way that we make whiskey. Uh, and that way you can get it done in about a day. 
in a much more sealed and reliable conditions with temperature controls. Either way, you end up with a wart, they call it musto, six to nine percent alcohol, depending on the yeast in action. We, uh, I don't, we, when we were in uh, Oaxaca with uh, Paul, Mm -hmm. with uh, Mike Elgin uh, on his Day of the Dead uh, experiences, we went to a mezcal distillery and I had the great pleasure of beating up the smoked up, there's Lisa Pina, uh, yeah. They had already been fired and or actually, no, they, I guess they were about to go into the fire and uh, there's the pit. And this is an old school Mezcal distillery. That's a, that's a Tohono. Yeah. Yeah. This that's, is the wheel where they smoosh it and yeah. uh, it smells wonderful in the vat because there's a lot of sugars in there, but then, yeah, it's then, quite sweet. Yeah. And then it ferments for a while and there's a, you could tell it's fermenting, can't you? And uh, yeah. <laughs> ooh, bubble, bubble, it's, toil and trouble. It's ugly, yeah. <laughs> but that's the pure mezcal before dis- before a barreling or anything. You can see how clear it is coming out of the distill. The still, yeah, yeah. And this, this, their distillation is not that strange. It's similar to bourbon and many others. They do a column still, which they call shredding, and, and then a, and then a pot still, uh, which they call rectification, also a common term. So a two stage distillation. Um, there were versions of tequila just so used off the first stage, but the second stage has become the norm to be considered tequila. Typically comes out about 65% alcohol, which is super normal um, for a clear distillate. There are a few folks that are spending with triple distillation, but they complain about it removing more of the flavors of the agave. And the agave have a stronger flavor than barley does typically. And so, you know, there's, a, uh, there's an incentive to stay towards that. And... If you take that product and you bought, you cut it with water to take it down to 40% and stick it in a bottle, that's Blanco. That is silver tequila. Yeah. Uh, and again, you find white dog uh, from the Americans is bourbon before it's gone into barrels. Uh, and the same with things like uh, Famous Grouse has a version called Snow Grouse, which is also unbarreled uh, Scottish whiskey. So it's not that unusual, right? But the, the fact that a big portion of tequila stops there, it's because there is a significant flavor that comes from agave that people appreciate it. So you can stop there and it's less expensive to do that. You know, that, that process uh, of running through shredding and, and rectification takes a day. So, you know, in the modern industrial process, you can turn agave pinas into bottleable stuff in just two or three days. Yeah. We were Very, going to these ancient distilleries where it's, yeah. You know, traditional Children. style. Yeah. And and I should say tequila is just one kind of mezcal. It's all yeah. roughly the same, right? Yeah, they're all uh, they're well, mostly agave. They do different things. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean tequila is not smoky. No. And no. Most, most That's the biggest are. difference. Yeah, because they uh, yeah. I you yeah. will be happy to know, and I certainly was delighted when reading through some of the more detailed documentation, that they do use a chill filtration step to remove flocculants. Well, you don't want flocculants. You're yeah. Wrong. God. No. God, that's uh, those are, those are those. flocculants are like the new Linux. It's like a cancer. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't want those those cloudy oils, right? You want your tequila yeah. to stay clear, and so they use a chill filtration step on a lot of of modern tequila is chill filtered. Uh, but if you're going to get past blanco, now you talk about different aging steps, and so uh, reposado or AKA rested is two months in oak barrels, uh, typically North American oaks. Nothing special about them; they're they tend to be pretty straight up. If you put it for twelve months. In an oak barrel, you can call it aged orange. <laughs> nice. uh, there are arguments about the sizes of barrels. There are limits. They can't be smaller than 200 liters. Uh, it, with Reposado, there have been barrels as big as 20,000 liters, still considered Reposado <laughs> barrel. Um, with the Anjo barrels, it's uh, down around 600. Uh, there are extra Anjos, which are aged past three years. is considered unusually long. And it's because of the conditions. Um this is the same situation that American bourbon is in where it's a, the temperature ranges are too wide. It gets too warm. And so it's very easy to lose alcohol and or water depending on your humidity and temperature levels. And so the longer you spend in the barrel, it often can go quite bitter. And so a 20 year aged tequila is a very unusual tequila. It means they've done something different in the aging process. They've kept it in a colder clime, more temperature controlled. Uh, it can happen. You're also seeing the same experimentation that's gone on in other whiskeys happening at tequila now where they are in fact aging and used american bourbon cask and sherry cask so as strange as you want to go uh what got me on to the idea of okay I'll, i could talk about tequila here as a proper brown liquor was a particular edition called hornitos black barrel 
Uh, Harnito is a distillery in the tequila region. Again, it would be about a four hour drive from here. They do an 18 month age process. So first they make an Anjo. So they do 12 months in uh, American oak, virgin oak. Uh, actually, it's originally the barrel is initially used for Reposado. And after it's been used for Reposado for a year, then it's used for Anjo at a year at a time. Then they take it out and they rebarrel it for four months in what they call a charred oak barrel. So I think it's barrels that they fired hard to charcoal to take certain bitter compounds out to add a different flavor to it. And then two months in lightly toasted oak. So that's much more the American oak style um, pre before it's used by bourbon. So three different barrelings for 18 months total. Um, the good news is inexpensive. I found this at Total Wine for $30. Um 40% alcohol, so it's been cut properly with water. There are cast strength tequilas. If you're into that sort of thing, this is not one of them. <laughs> if you're suicidal. Okay. So uh, it'll it'll wake you up, you know. If, if cast strength is going to be in the 60s. Wow. Um, but also that they tend not to lose much alcohol in the aging process. So you oh, can get some at, uh, at the high level just because they run at such uh, low humidities that they're often losing water uh, from their barrels more than they're losing alcohol. So in, uh, in would, order of age, it's Cristalino, Añejo, yeah. and then Reposado, or? Reposado is the rest. It's two months in barrels. Okay. Uh, Añejo is at least, yeah, at least a year. Okay. And then they're extra. And so the black barrel has been a real award winner because it's the Añejo, but then they've done additional barreling with it. You can nice. see how dark it is. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. One of the flavors that I find from some tequilas that you don't find from other grains that I really appreciate is that pepper note. Just a real punchy pepper up front rather than spicy. And, uh, but other than that, drinks really smoothly. Like it, this was a, a comfortable couple of ounces. I wouldn't even put ice in this. It doesn't need it. It's a beautiful bottle too. I love it. Yeah. And for, and for $30, you kind of can't go wrong. Like, That's my amazing. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Like everything in Mexico, it's affordably priced. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Except for electronics. Mexico, Mexico is not as inexpensive as it used to be. You know, everybody's yeah. been affected by inflation here. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I uh, I saw how much it was cost to get a massage. It used to be pennies. Pennies on the dollar, I tells you. That's Richard Campbell. He's in PV, Puerto Vallarta. Uh, well, he'll be back. You, Where are you going to be next week? Somewhere fun? Redmond. I'll be, I'll be on the Microsoft campus. Because? Uh, MP Summit. MP Summit. Okay, MP Summit. Uh Richard's renesradio.com. That's where you'll find his podcasts, both Renez Radio and .NET Rocks. And uh, it's easier to find his podcast than it is to find him, I got to tell you. They don't move around mm. so much. Renezradio.com. Paul Therat, the field guide to Windows 11, now includes Moment 5. How did you do that? No, we're getting there. It's not, it's not, that, it's not, quite, it's not Moment all Moment four and a half. Okay, fine. I've started updating. Yeah. Four and three quarters. Yep. The beauty of it when you buy it at leanpub.com is you get the updates. It's part of it. Mm -hmm. and now, what did you say? 1,100 pages? Yep. <laughs> and no, it's a. Uh, yeah, Tell me you know, use 28 just, point some, fonts. Yeah, at some point, they can't bind that thing. You know, yeah. like it's just. <laughs> bind it? No, you can't bind I it. I reached that. I think I've reached that point. It's well uh, beyond that. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you know, You'll find I'm that the toll team of Windows authors. He is. That's <laughs> yeah. right. Somebody told me that that's was it you? That's why. Yeah, yeah. The three volumes. Trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Because he refused to make the book shorter. We talked about that last right. week. Uh, mm -hmm. That's leanpub.com. You can also get Windows Everywhere. His book about the history of <clears throat> Windows via its programming languages. Of course, his blog is therot.com. T h u r r o double good dot com. And when you get there, you'll find uh, a lot of great content. But there is a secret tip I'll give you if you subscribe to the premium version. Just beyond that paywall, even more <laughs> great stuff, including the original chapters of Windows Everywhere. Well worth it. Therot.com. Paul, you're going to stay in Mexico City, or are you coming home too? No, next week we come home on uh, Tuesday. So uh, I, as I take off for Mexico for two weeks... Um, mm -hmm. And actually, Micah Sargent will be in here uh, next Wednesday and the Wednesday after. Uh, okay. I will just think of you as I'm flying down there. I can't wait. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'll be in a fatal position on the floor crying because I'm not here anymore, but it'll be okay. You love it down there. When it, You're going to have to just at some point. I saw you got your cards. Uh, I'm watching your, uh, uh, your videos on YouTube. By the way, mm -hmm. that's another great tip. Eternal Spring, right? Is that what it's called? 
Yep, that's right. Uh, search YouTube.com at Eternal Spring, Eternal Spring, and find out about their whole journey, uh, moving down there, Paul and Stephanie getting their residencies and all that. So, so you don't yet have the ability to stay there forever, though, right? You have to. No, we could stay here for three years now if we had to. Wow. And then, Why are you um, coming home? Yeah, that, after that, it's permanent. You don't have a dog. Your kids are out of the house. Well, we have cats. So kids cats. are still not sorted. I don't know. I, my neighbor literally asked us this question, and I said, I don't, you know, we got family and friends. And he said, Paul, it's everyone hard. has family and friends. It's hard. I, I understand. <laughs> what does this make you special? I understand. You should move here. You know, like, oh, man. I don't know. If I could do it, I would. Uh, yeah. But I have family and friends, too. Mostly a wife. But that's a story mm, yeah. for another day. Uh, Paul we'll and Richard it. will be we'll back next visit. week. She might like it. Yeah. She well, we're going to visit next week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Paul and uh, Richard will be back next week, 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. Pacific on a Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. And because we are headed into summertime this Sunday, yeah. it is now eight, uh, 1,800. <laughs> 1800. Love, if I get my I math the right, time zone math. 1800 yeah. UTC. If you want to watch us live, Mexico does YouTube. not celebrate daylight savings. Yeah, isn't that nice great? Day? This is that was last year was the last well, it's time. It's great. It's bad. Like it's you know, for me it's a little bad because it makes the time difference two hours. Oh, not one. Yeah. See, yeah, for us there's no a, time difference in, in uh, Cabo. Right. We are in our own time zone. Yeah. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, you can watch YouTube.com/slash twit. That's where we put. We, we, as soon as the show starts, we'll start a live stream. As soon as it ends, we'll stop it. Uh, club members get to watch what's going on in between. But uh, but for everybody else, youtube.com slash twit. Uh, you can, of course, download shows after the fact at uh, twit.tv slash www for Windows Weekly. There's a Windows Weekly YouTube channel for the videos. That's the edited, you know, post videos. And then uh, subscribe in your favorite podcast client, audio or video. You can get it every week the minute it's available. Join the club, and you'll have your very own ad-free versions as well. Twit.tv slash club twit. On behalf of Paul and Richard, I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you in three weeks. He'll be back next three week. Weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. I'm Windows Weekly. Bye-bye.